from hydrate. The current situation makes it very necessary to online and in turn protect privacy. Realizing these facts, we, the Department of Computer Science, Saundara Institute of Management and Science, in association with IQAC, ICT Academy, and CSI local chapter, have organized a national level symposium on cyber awareness, CAP01, as its first project. Let us begin with a small teaser video on the event, followed by briefing of the same by Professor Rekhasi. Thank you, Rashmi. I'm very much happy uh, to take this opportunity to launch or to introduce our uh, program, GAP, that is Cyber Awareness Program. 28th January is celebrated as Data Protection Day. On this occasion, Soundarya Institute of Management and Science, Department of Computer Science, has initiated a program on cyber awareness. In this regard, I extend my greeting on behalf of Soundarya Institute of Management and Science, Department of Computer Science, to all the delegates who are present here. And also I extend my warm greetings to the parents, the students, and the faculty fraternity who have joined this program. Then why this program? What is the necessity of having this program? Because whenever we start doing any program, we should know the reason or the objective behind it. Hence, the objective is, we all know that we are in the world of digital era. And hence, it is not just getting connected and taking the benefits of the digitization, but it is a responsibility as a responsible citizen to understand the threats that are happening in this digital world. Hence, it is rightly quoted that every education institution should make a cyber security a priority. We all know that students are our future workforce. They are our future teachers and they are our parents. The impact of their security aware behavior will be a significant and far reaching to the society. Realizing these facts, the Department of Computer Science, as BCA, has designed an institutional social responsibility project called CAP. CAP stands for a cyber awareness program, ASH01. So this is our first project, which we have intended to do for a complete one year so that we can educate the students on cyber attacks and also how to protect themselves and their community from these potential attacks. This entire program we are executing in an online platform through various events such as webinars, quiz, symposium, panel discussion, short movies, e-collage and debate. As a part of our first project, we have come out with three different programs. First being a e-collage. We have requested students to do a collage based on cyber attacks and cyber prevention and upload it through an online. The best 10 collages will be awarded. So that is one medium of uh, uh, educating or creating an awareness among the students. And second being a symposium, which has been organized today. And the third is a short movie. So very happy to share that the students of BCA have designed uh, movies by doing a lot of researching on various uh, case studies that has been evolved in the online platforms. So they have taken those case studies, they have scripted those case studies, and they have designed an animated movie. So these are the three initial steps the CAP program has initiated. So through this, our aim is to educate, at least this year we want to educate 1 lakh people on this cyber security and make them to understand that we are no more in a safe world. We need to be very caution and we need to be very alert. And it is one of the responsible, uh, as a responsible citizen, it is a duty of us to understand the threats that is happening around us and how best we can protect ourselves and also protect our environment. So this is our objective. 
Uh, with this, I request uh, Prasad sir kindly play a promo video where uh, students have developed to project their awareness program through this platform on cyberbullying. Prasad sir. The environment that we are living in. Thank you. Bullying is a serious growing problem. We all have heard the recent news about increase in bullying in schools, colleges, and universities. Bullying among children has always been around. What is changing is the nature of bullying. Cyberbullying is a newer form of bullying. It involves using the internet to attack, insult, threaten, and spread rumors about other people. As more kids spend more time online and texting, some of them are taking their conflicts online. It used to be that bullies use playgrounds and schools to prey on their victims. The internet has made their playground a whole lot bigger. Cyberbullying makes it easier for children to hide their identities. So bullies are not necessarily the biggest kid around. Sometimes they are just kids filled with anger or hatred. There are different types of cyberbullying. Some kids are creating websites that involve some form of attack on others. Sometimes they are posting hurtful messages, images or information. Cell phones are also being used in bullying situations. Inappropriate texts, photos or videos are being used to blackmail others. Some bullies are looking for a broader audience and may even capture physical attacks on videos and post them online for other students. 68% of youngsters have reported cyberbullying in the last few decades. Bullying should be taken seriously. Children who are bullied can feel very lonely and emotionally weak. They can also have long-lasting emotional scars. Some may even repeat the abusive pattern in their adult relationships. The vast majority of kids are neither the bully nor the victim. They are the bystanders and they often feel very confused about how to handle the situation. Adults must partner with children to help them create a social network in support of them. We need to be talking to schools about our concerns. We have certainly had enough of wake-up calls to take bullying seriously. It's time to take stand. Hence, we the students of Saundarya Institute of Management and Science, Department of Computer Science, BCA, has initiated Cyber Awareness Program, taking animated short movies as one of its mediums. Do lend a hand in creating awareness by watching the short movie on Sim's official YouTube channel and also join us for Symposium on 28th January 2022 at 10am. Thank you. Wow, that's a wonderful start. I should must congratulate my students, fair friends, who have taken their first step in a very beautiful way. I, I agree, uh, you know, the effort what you are making would be pro truthful and it will be fruitful unless and until we take a pledge that we will educate ourselves and also educate our society. And at last, I thank all the delegates who have joined us for this uh, a great cause. Let's all together make this space a cyber uh, you know, free space, that is threat-free space, and make our end minds to get aware about not to be attacked because, you know, uh, this uh, the innocence, the ignorance, all these are the causes of these attacks. So I want the students to take a, a great step, take an initiative in being more aware about these attacks and be our responsible citizens. So with this, I um, greet all the students community here for all the best for your project. And also I request all the delegates for, uh, you know, I extend my sincere gratitude to all the delegates who have accepted our invitation and joined their hands for this great project. Thank you. Thank you very much. And over to you, Rashu. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Ms. Bhavna Prabhu, student of second year BCA and Mr. Rahul Kini, student of third year BCA, for the welcome address. Thank you, Rashmi. It's an honor to welcome our guest of honor, Mr. Shashank Shekhar Garudia. Sir is a BTEC from BIT Sindri with MBA Marketing from IGNOU. 
He has domain experience of process automation, safe and smart cities and critical infrastructure and has served power, oil, gas, steel, defense, telecom sectors in project management, business development and business operations for close to four decades. Mr. Shashank started his career from teaching, moved to PSU private MNCs and served fertilizer, Indalco, ABB, Datamatics, G4S, HFCL. He's one of the founder members of ISA Delhi section. Sir is also a motivational speaker, an influencer, and a relationship management come behavioral science trainer. We welcome you, sir. I take immense pleasure in welcoming our today's keynote speaker, Mr. Balaji Venkateshwar. Sir is a technology business executive with co specialization in cyber defense. He has architected and operationalized multiple cyber security capability centers in last 25 years. Mr. Balaji has also mentored more than 30,000 plus cyber defense experts so far and has one patent granted and nine more patents filled in cyber and technology space. Sir has served in various cyber defense and related senior positions at SBI, Wipro BPO, Bank of America, PwC, Qualcomm, and IDFC First Bank. He has taken voluntary retirement from corporate life after serving as CISO at IDFC First Bank and decided to devote his life for nation building. On behalf of Soundary Institution of Management and Science and BCA Department, we welcome you, sir. I am profusely elated to welcome Dr. Balaji Rajendran. Sir has 21 plus years of research and development experience in network information systems, currently leading the center of excellence in DNA security and national level effort for adoption of digital signatures and public key infrastructure in India. Dr. Balaji has architected and established a critical information infrastructure for production site for an organization created an Indian academic networking portal, a first of its kind and its time for sharing of academic courses and events. He also led development of a community information system and carried out pilot de developments. Sir has specialization in building technology-led platforms and fostering user communities, design and development of user support systems, applied AI trading agents, intelligent tutoring systems, email security, flair for applied research and training and community computing initiatives. On behalf of Sondra Institute of Management and Science, Department of Computer Science, we extend our warm welcome to you, sir. It's my privilege to invite Dr. Mohabad Bisbahuddin. Sir is an Associate Director at Center of Development of Advanced Computing. Sir is a B graduate from Gulbarga University, has completed his MTech from Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, and also hold PhD in Computer Science and Engineering in the same university in the field of network security. Dr. Mohammed has also been Sir Staff Scientist, Technical Officer, Principal Technical Officer and Joint Director in CADVC. Sir has an industry knowledge on cyber security, algorithms, security training and many more. Some more of the skills that Sir holds are cloud security, information security awareness, e-authentication, adaptive authentication and many others. On behalf of Soundarya Institution and Management and BCA Department, we welcome you, sir. With pleasure, I extend my warm welcome to CEO, Mr. Ketan Kumar, Director of Administration, Mr. Mathai, our Principal, Dr. Suresh C. Hegadi, Vice Principal, Professor Shivkumar Ganachari, IQAC Coordinator, Coordinator, Mr. Ashwin Kumar, HOD of various departments and teaching fraternities of various colleges. Our student friends across Pan India, we welcome you all. Thank you, Rahul and Bhavna. Relying on the government to protect privacy is like asking a peeping Tom to install your window blinds. With that thinking note, may I request Mr. Shashank Shekhar Garuria, Chairman Cyber Vidya P, to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rashmi. Can you allow me to share the screen? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Right, Namaskar. My, I'm audible. Yes, sir. Okay. So, with one Hindi couplet, I would like to start because we are building the nation. Uh, we are working on that particular end. So, one small couplet. Navin Shilp Madhur Shaili Naya Ras De De. Navin Shilp Madhur Shaili Naya Ras De De. मन के कुंदन को जो चमकाए वो पारस दे दे पूजने आए गगन वाले मेरी धरती को पूजने आए गगन वाले मेरी धरती को माँ मेरी माटी को वो साहस दे दे माँ मेरी माटी को वो साहस दे दे बट दिस आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक वंस अगेन द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स मैडम रेखा हु गिव मी द गिव अस द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू बिकम पार्ट ऑफ दिस वंडरफुल शो ऑफ साइबर awareness program as you all we all are living in this world of cyber attack and it has become part of our life and every day the attack is getting complex and we have to we are left over with only one choice strategize 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 to mitigate the challenges neutralize the attackers and the attacks so with that i would like to start my thought like how we made this particular process in place like why we should be going for this kind of an institution wherein we are going to help our nation to have at least 1 million cyber defenders in next 4 years time and this cannot be done in one year two year and it cannot be done in a college and that is how the concept started like we should and we this was a blessing in disguise like we were all passing through this uh, challenge of covid 19 so so naturally all courses were going online and that is what we utilized got the help from the country certain and everyone who gave us the hands on and we started training the uh, engineers upcoming engineers at the budding level itself third year final year students and in the first program itself we found like around 4000 engineers join online because we were having the platform for more than 10000 we could take in one go so we handling this particular number with this particular kind of infrastructure was becoming very easy and we all people from corporate world around 16 people we left the various organizations and joined hand together with the mission help our nation help the budding talents to void uh, this whatever void is available because we need 10 lakh people right away and whereas we are hardly having 3000 people this course was launched by aict in two years back but hardly 19 issues are the taker and even if they graduate it will take four years time whereas the challenge is is right now so only thing was live with this strategize yourself work on it and train more and more budding talents and at the same time the corporate people so that whoever are facing the challenges at corporate level in the industry infrastructure side they are also equally equipped and at the same time the number game is taken care of you know like in 1995 then this world was open for it and how the space was taken over by we people the indians the bharatiya so naturally the same time has come for us wherein the world is looking towards india because the numbers of the young professionals in india is too too high so naturally if they are equipped to that level wherein they become the cyber defenders at the fastest pace which is uh, hardly four months we are taking to equip them to make the real cyber defenders and that is what we are doing we are partnering with various institutes for this particular thing because 
how we will be reaching to those kind of engineers. So naturally, we are reaching to various NCOs, starting from IIT, NITs, and uh, uh, class, uh, you can say C-class city uh, institutes also, wherein people are more focused to get more and more vocational training. So the answer comes the vocational. And the new education policy also, if you see, it says whatever gap is there, whatever void is there, it should be filled by taking the help of NGOs. And that is how we made this organization Cyber Vidya Peet as a vocation, uh, vocational education trainer organization. Here we, we are around 16 people at the helm of total affair. We do have all kind of facility wherein we are training the people. One is uh, the trainers at the same time. We do have SAS-based simulator for hands-on exposure because like you might have seen in the flight, uh, like captains are trained, 90% training happens only, uh, you can say theoretical or experiences only, or on the simulator only. 10% is finally on the real flight. Same way, we thought we should also have the facility wherein we get give the, the students the hand, uh, hands-on exposure on simulators. And that is what we have already signed off with a couple of companies on this particular thing, wherein we will be getting the facility at a very lower rate. And this training of engineers, we are hardly, or training of BCA or MCA people, we are hardly charging anything because we wanted that we should be working towards nation building. Yes, we are taking uh, payments from the corporate world or the teachers, the trainers, wherein we have to train, make them to that level wherein they are equipped to handle such numbers of students day, day in, day out. Our whole system is uh, with, blended with 5E model, wherein the effectiveness of like, you might be seeing like every day we are having the courses online whether the students are available or not available, we do have the machine learning capability available wherein we are working with that. We know whether the students are available with us or not, what they are doing. Every 10 minutes, we get the, give the pop-up questions. They have to answer. And it's a very, very serious kind of a training. And uh, yes, it is true that uh, people are leaving also because uh, when you are having tough challenges, it is a kind of a commando challenge commando training. So commando type training, every, everywhere you are going to be thrown out, means if you are not adequately uh, ready to face that challenge, so naturally they are getting dropped also. But once they are again ready to take the challenge, they are entering into the project from zero and then entering for the training. So it is like a uh, situation wherein uh, we do have the 22 doors and any door, if you fail, you are out. You have to come back from gate one only. So naturally, it's a very tough challenge for every student. But at the same time, who are passionate, who are serious about it, they are really trained, getting trained, and are getting a very good salary also after getting this training. So I would like to not take much of time on this particular thing. Already we have taken this course, 10,000 students batch as internship we can take. We have already trained people for that particular thing, wherein uh, they are available in the market and they are working rather employed with various corporate world. We are also going to have this one year postgraduate diploma in cyber defense, which is uh, already in discussion with a couple of uh, good issues. And we are expecting that by July, we will be starting the full program for it. And train the trainer is already available. We are working on it. And from uh, this date, uh, 21st of February, we are having the program wherein uh, for the corporate world also we are doing. And uh, online live classroom, all these kind of training will be available for you. Every now and then we are working on innovative things and getting the inputs from the students also, getting the inputs from the corporate world too, how to get equipped more and more. and. Uh, really strategizing on this whole thing. So thank you. I, I would not take much of time on this uh, because I would like that my 
next gentleman should be speaking more on this. Balaji should be there so that he, he should be taking care of the real approach of whole thing. So thank you, uh, Rashmi. And thank you, uh, Rikaji and the team organizers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That indeed brought us a step closer to our goal in cybersecurity. If you put a key under the map for the cops, a burglar can find it too. Criminals are using every technological tool at their disposal to hack people's account. If they know there's a key hidden somewhere, they won't stop until they find it. So it becomes very important for us as users to be very aware of what data is being shared and to whom. With that thought, I now request Mr. Balaji Venkateshwar, Chief Mentor Cyber Vidya Pete, to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, at the onset, you know, I think I must uh, congratulate the the organizer of this program. Uh, a next generation thought because are you all able to see my screen and hear me you know, because i was just saying some yes sir we can see your screen you can go ahead sir We are able to see your screen, sir. Opportunity unlimited. Cyber defense yes, education. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, you know, uh, nothing can be as opportune time for really uh, organizing cyber awareness program. And that too for a year, year long program covering 100,000 people and plus. I think this is an awesome thought. The reason is that, you know, the world is reading in pain. Uh, there are two risks that I see it, country at risk, corporate at risk, and citizen at risk. There are the three things blended together. You know, I think there is a need for changing the game plans where awareness becomes the minimum, bare minimum things. And, uh, you know, as I go into the statistics, you know, it will be something very startling in statistics. You know, I just, uh, you know, created for you, you people to have a look of it. And, you know, then we'll realize that what an important work these organizers are doing for making a real good impact. And a year is a definitely a good target to start such programs because it cannot be in just one or two. So it has to be a year long program. So uh, let, let me take you through the two journey. Okay. One is that country at risk, and then I'll take you citizen at risk. So the country at risk, you know, as we speak, you know, uh, the Russian rails is reading in pain. Almost all the rails were standstills. They were unable to move. The Belarus rail, you know, company has been severely, you know, under attack by the ransomware. And the group said that they want to release the 50, you know, ailing patients. It's a political attack. So if you release them, I'll give you the key. I don't want to make you die, but, you know, I can give you the key if you release some of them. And I was surprised, you know, the audacity of these, you know, attackers, the level of uh, the ways they have attacked the entire journey. I think it is something uh, uh, unimaginable. Same time, a week back, you know, 10 days back, Ukraine's almost all government department has become dysfunctional. They were unable to access the files. They were unable to uh, take any decisions online. Digitalization was everywhere, but digital was not being used. I call it is a country at risk. We also suffered, you know, in 2019, we suffered a major attack on our power systems. You know, people don't talk much about it, but we know that, you know, it was a cyber attack. And if you look into the attack pattern in the corporate world, almost everywhere the prototype is being tested. So when you need it most, it won't work. So recent attacks, uh, it's just a reminder that digital world is going in a very different world. While it is going to make the life easier for the people, at the same time, it's going to create a mess 
if we don't do things right at the inception of the design level. So, a lot of stories, you know, a lot of serious stories, you know. I think one of the serious stories which impacted the life of millions of people was the colonial pipeline attack in US, where the gas were not available and the country where the gas was required to be, they were under minus 20 degree temperature. And gas was being utilized for actually doing the heating in the house. Think about it. You are living in minus 20 degree, not prepared to live like that without a heating elements and the power is not there. It, it was an absolute messy, messy type of attacks. And there are so many of attack, you know, I can't count you, you know, it is more than 6,000 attack, uh, which has been reported in public, large attack in the last 300 days. So almost 20 major attack is happening every day. On same time, you know, if you look into the citizens at risk, the attackers are, you know, are predators and the cyberspace is like a jungle. Boys and girls, very young girls, taking advantage of the systems and related vulnerabilities. They are making calls, eliciting the OTPs, the passwords, IDs of the people, those who do not understand that, you know, under panic, they go and give it. In India alone, if you, you know, I've, I've got the data from the Delhi crime cell, you know, cyber crime cells as well as Bombay crime cells together. It is 2,400 crore of loss reported. I'm just talking reported, minded. There are many which are not reported. Almost 2,400 crore of losses to the senior citizens, the old, old people, the normal people, the smart people, young people. Significant, significant amount of loss. And I call them, the people are educated, but many of them are digitally illiterate. And that is the reason I said at the onset of the program today, that the job, you know, Swandari Institute of Management uh, has taken and the team, those who are behind the thought, it's an amazing state because we have to make the people digitally illiterate. And we have to make them, you know, a lot lot better than just digitally literate, literate, but you know, we have to go start the journey. So journey will start at three layer. The first layer is the awareness layer. Second is the training layer. And third is the education layer. So we have to really think in a very strategic manner, how to go ahead with that program, where we start with awareness, build some theme around the trainings, and then educate the masses who write the code correctly at the onset so that the attack can not take place and the citizens are secure. If you look into the significant amount of, you know, uh, the attack which is happening, you know, we don't have the data from the India, but if you look into this uh, attack in the last five year crime data, it is stalking actually. It's very, very big. You know, I can't tell you how big it is, but you know, it looks like, you know, it's significantly big. And I, again, I am talking about the reported crime. And from individuals, it is 13.3 billion losses has been reported in last year time in US alone. I'm not talking about the global. So the estimate says that number of losses, you know, caused by the cyber attack is almost, or a parallel economy in the, you know, dark web is almost like a $5 trillion. Just to remind you, our economy size, the entire GDP is $3.1 trillion. So to India can be accommodated in cyber crime money, which is being traded in the, you know, in the cyber jungles. It's little gentlemen is significantly large, large losses that is being incurred by the corporate world. And monetary losses are very small losses. Think about it. You know, I always think that we must think about the negative things so that we understand the risk and the role of the engineering graduates, role of the BCAs and MCAs, role of the professors and the teachers, role of the mentors of the IT, you know, organizations. 
there is a significant amount of work to do before we go back to sleep forever. Many methods, you know, the city at risk, many methods. Some of them are for losses and some of them are absolutely weird. So let's take an example. Today we have got 1.6 million, you know, 16 million people or 1.6 crore people in India having pacemakers. All of you are aware about the pacemaker. If the pacemaker doesn't work for two minutes, the person will die. And the pacemaker is connected with a Wi-Fi entity for repairs and maintenance. And that signals, it keeps emanating the signals. If somebody hacks into those signals, and it is, I have seen that it is a very much doable, it does not require a super skills. It requires a very simple skills to hack into those pacemakers because the they use, you know, old Wi-Fi signals with no encryption, almost like a clear text format. 1.6 crore people, if a malware inje gets injected to, because every machine, every pacemaker is in the herd and the person is carrying a mobile phone or a broadband connection next to them. The way the Stuxnet has happened in 2008, similar thing can happen for the pacemaker. 1.6 crore people life will be at death at the mercy of the attackers. Think about the gas pipeline, the oxygen gas pipeline being, being supplied to the hospitals. Millions of them across the globe. In India alone, we have got more than 30,000, you know, hospitals connected with gas pipelines. Now suppose if the oxygen supply gets stopped, choked, because the SCADA system, which is vulnerable, can be attacked remotely. What will happen in the hospital? At a time, we have more than 600,000 people in the ICUs across the country. Their life will be at a stake. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, there's not time to see this as a challenge. It is time for us to see as an opportunity. So I'll, let me take you through, you know, some of the very critical dimension of uh, what is the opportunity, you know, because these are the challenges, but what are the opportunity? Because many of you are students, many of you are professors, many of you are teachers. It's a good time to really understand how the market is feeling about the security requirements. Frankly speaking, the cyber dimensions, cyber security dimension is a serious engineering problem. The engineer, those who have created the tool, they have not created it correctly. That is the reason exploits are being written and it is being misutilized. So if the cyber defense has to be there, it has to be an engineered solution. It cannot be a next button clicks, which are coming from Microsoft GUI graphical user interfaces. We need to go back to the drawing board and we should know how to write the code correctly at the inception, how to write a hardware design correctly, how to write a BIOS correctly, how to do the inter interactions between the BIOS and the kernels using the UFI is done correctly. We need to go back to the engineering table. Who will do that? It has to be done by the you, the young generation and the professor of the academia, those who are in this space. And it is your Solomon duty to see that, you know, we create the right talent pool at the inception. As I speak today, the Michael Page, the world's largest HR company, they say they have got 3.1 million job open globally, and there is no taker for that. 3.1 million jobs. The government of India in the last parliament session, the certain has submitted a report under the wrap of, you know, National Cyber Security Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office that we need 1.5 million cyber engineer today. 1.5 million engineer is needed today alone in India. If we want to bridge the gap globally, we have to produce 3 million cyber engineer today, which is significantly large number. And there is need for, you know, 
thinking in that direction. If you look into, you know, a very interesting cyber defense market, which is a $100 billion opportunity available for the country who can bridge this gap. By 2025, we need globally around 10 million cyber engineers. 10 million. If Europe wants, or you, in the US want, they cannot produce that much of child in, a, in five year windows. Forget about engineers. So if, if this bridge is to be bridged by someone, it can be only India, nobody else. What we did, Sasanji was saying it rightly, in 1995, what we did was a magic. The market needed cyber you know, IT engineers and we created the IT engineers. The engineering colleges across the country mushroomed over a period of time. There was significant amount of demand and we were able to match the gap. The time has come when we need to create cyber defender, the cyber rachak to meet that gap actually. Our success lies on the soldier of academy and the students of the next generation. If you are looking for an opportunity, the opportunity is waiting for you in cyberspace. Just have a look of it, you know, the number. This is the current, current you know, 1 million cyber security as per the current design. It is, Michael Page said around 1.5 million cyber engineers are required today in India. For a country that supports a majority of the world's technology outsourcing requirement, it's alarming to see that India's talent shortage is 9% higher than the global average in cyberspace. As India grapples with the state spate of cyber attacks and growing skill shortage in cybersecurity, the need to rethink their strategies to develop and improve the existing cyber workforce has never been more material than today. Trust me, India is grappling in a real crisis in cyberspace. If you don't know how to manage the systems, we are in trouble. If you don't have resources to manage the system, it's a bigger trouble. And the resources that we have today at compute level, it is from adversary nations. It is an OS layer, which is coming from adversary nations. There is no one is friend, ladies and gentlemen, and nobody is enemy in diplomatic stage. Everybody is fighting for their own nation. Let's understand it. United Nation is a useless organization in my opinion, because the personal interest of a country is more important than anything else. We want, we produce the highest amount of, you know, talent pool in IT today. In Fortune 500 companies, 273 companies are having leadership level Indians only in IT space. The CTOs are almost all 273 of them are IT uh, from India. But we don't take the privilege of producing cyber defense kits. We don't produce computers. We don't produce operating system, which is doable, but we never done that. We did Bharat operating system. I think some folks are there from CDAC. They know that they have done it. Country has spent significant amount of money on it, but it will not take off. We don't produce the application where the source code is ours. How do you trust the source codes? How do you trust the .NET, the compiler does not have a date codes? How do you trust the Java, which has been created in Department of Defense in US, it does not have the backdoors. And these are serious challenge. The Android phone on an average has got 250 zero developmentees, which is not fixed by the government agencies purposely. So that you can be snoofed, you can be, you know, your voice can be heard, your video can be seen by the intelligence agencies across the globe, those who are creators of the Androids. The modem that you use, whether it is LTE or is a 4G or 5G is created by adversaries. They are not been created by your country. You can't trust them. So we are really grappling with real crisis in cyberspace. We create, I'm sorry to use that word. We create IT coolies. We don't create IT engineers. 
we produce 7 million IT professionals every year. If you add BCA, MCA, Masters in Computer Science, BTech, BSc, IT, all together we produce 7 million IT professionals. Time has come that we need to create every layer and de-layer the foreign adversary tools from the country. There is a significant amount of opportunities are available and we don't have dearth of talent pools. We produce reports, we produce papers, we put it in the Google scholars and somebody in the Google scholar team from the behind in US, they read your papers and they create a patent out of it. Don't put a paper in public space unless you have a patent on it. Go for a patent filing in India. It's much cheaper. It's 5,000, 10,000 rupees is not there. And there are nice on those who are doing it. We need to fix the issues at many layers. And young boys and girls, those who are listening my, you know, deliberations today, my humble request to each one of you, create things indigenous. Why, do, why can't we create a .NET in country which you can trust? The compiler will behave the way you want it to behave. And you can do it. It's no rocket science. Stop using your, you know, the window systems. Go into the black and white screens. Start learning the low-level low machine language. Write your own compilers. Make it behave, make it dance the way you want it to dance. Nobody else can do it. We have missed our generation. We have created a mess. We expect the next generations to take the charge. The frauds are happening because our software has not been designed correctly. And you are the engineers, you are the students who is going to fix it. It won't happen unless you do it yourself. Cyber is an engineering problem and it requires engineered solutions. By 2025, even if we don't do anything, we'll increase $35 billion revenue. But if we train in the college at internship level, five months internship course in cyber defense can change the paradigm altogether to $200 billion in next five years time. AICT has, as Sasangji has said, AICT has already introduced a syllabus for BTEC in cybersecurity. Only 20 or 30 colleges are open, except those private colleges, they have already introduced the BTEC syllabus and hardly there are 20, 30, 50 people. Some colleges, large colleges like SRM, they are having five or 10 students in that space. There is a need for a large chunk of, and, and the syllabus is outdated. The worst is that syllabus is five to seven year old. AICT has published last year, it doesn't. National education policy, which is supposed to carry the flavor of our future, does not have a word cyber, cyber defense or cyber security as a part of the program. Set it aside. Don't wait for government or government entity to do anything for you. Just go by the market paradigm. What is the demand and what is the supply? Demand for cyber defense engineer is very high and supply is negligible. If you are in that paradigm, you will be chosen by the market on your own. And you will be able to double the salaries in next two to, four, three to five years time. So there is a significant opportunity exist in cyberspace. And it is a good time to really look in. India can produce shortfall by 2025. 10 million cyber defenders or cyber rachak can be produced in India. And India can be the savior for the world. India has potential to be the world leader in cyber defense workforce creation because nobody else can create that much of masses. India can take 35 billion of additional potential opportunity by 2024, even at the current pace. If you can create 5 million cyber engineers using an internship model, using a public-private partnership, using a skill development program as a vocational training, and we can partner with you to make it happen. 
we can create 200 billion dollar opportunity and i'll give you a simple thing if the 5 million people can be placed outside the country at the rate of 100000 dollars even if the 10000 dollar is saved by the students as a earning sent back to the country our gdp will grow by 200 billion dollars that's a significant money why do we require government intervention i think we have educational institution has to play a much bigger role and the student they have to participate in those roles to make it happen i won't take much of time i know i am all running out of the time but uh, we need to act now for world leaders position in cyber ready workforce we are talking we want to be the wisp guru and i think it is a good time to be the wisp to be the cyber you know guru for the world and we have the necessary talent pool let's join the head and make it happen i'll be more than happy to participate in any effort that you are doing in cyber education space and training space uh awareness space you know i leave it to you people to run it but you know at education space as well as training space i'll be more than happy to partner with you guys need significant alignment with market and need significant change in iict syllabus and we have the syllabus available which are market ready and we use blended education during the internship four month internship you know intensive internship if you are committed to the goal and you are passionate about learning and cracking something in four month you will be able to really take your education forward to a next realm altogether that is where i am you know thank you so much uh, organizers really appreciate uh, giving us an opportunity to speak and uh, wish you all the best for your cap program because i think this is something which is definitely needed at all layers but i believe that you know as a institution you need to go beyond awareness program embed security as a part of the curriculum and we'll definitely do a small partnership with you to make it happen if you have a dream i commit you that my team will work together with you to realize that dream at any cost thank you so much ladies and gentlemen thanks for being with us today in party present thank you thank you very much thank you sir to insight some threats people face in the digital world recent attacks the possible attacks we could face and the alarming increase in recent times help us take a leap in cyber awareness well now it's time to launch our first multimedia short movie on cyber security the short movie is intended to create a sense of cyber awareness to general public and ensure that they don't fall for such traps in your future and here it is prasad sir Prasad sir, I request you to play our first video. And these are my team members who have created the video. Prasad sir.
I am sorry for the interruption. Education institutions need to make cybersecurity a priority. Students are the future workforce, future teachers, and parents. The impact of their security aware behavior will be significant and far reaching for the society. Realizing the above fact, the Department of Computer Science, BCA, has designed an institutional social responsibility ISR project, Cyber Awareness Program, CAP. It is a year long program aimed to educate students on cyber attacks and how to protect themselves and their community from the potential attacks. Mode of executing the CAP program is through online mode, by conducting various activities such as webinars, quiz, panel discussion, short movie Z collage, debate, and more. Today, I will be narrating a story of a girl who was very excited about her phone and ended up falling in trouble while texting casually over social media. Yuri, finally got my phone. Um, let's create accounts on social media and make new friends. This, this, and this. Hello, how are you? You look very impressive in your photos. Can you please share the photos with me? Wow, got my first friend on Facebook. He seems interesting. Let's talk. Well, I wonder which pic should I send him. Um, not this, no not this too. Got it. This would be perfect. I am sure I would impress him with this. Now, that Sweta has exchanged pictures, she does not know what the future has in stake for her. Let's see, what is in store for Sweta? Yes, I finally got a bait. Now I can use her photos and she will never know. Oh my god. To what situation I brought myself into. This is a trap. Sweta thinks about the matter deeply. She loses herself thinking about her image and future, only to lose her mental health. Her mother observes her state for a few days, and later confronts her daughter about the matter. Sweta, firstly is very frightened to tell her mother, but she musters all courage and inform her mother about the matter. Without any delay, her mother consults the police regarding the issue. Tell me madam. How can I help you? Sir, my daughter, Sweta, has fallen into deep trouble. We gifted her a phone for her 8th birthday. In excitement, she has shared her pictures to a random person online, and he is now misusing her pictures with strange kind of edits. Sir, please catch the guy as soon as possible. Do not worry madam. We will find the guy. You please register the FIR and we will redirect this to the cybercrime branch. The police then contacts the cybercrime branch and inform them about the issue. The cyber police and the police officer, assures the parent on finding the guy and punishing him. Sir, we have got a lead in the case. My team has figured out the criminal, and is already set to catch him. He will be behind bars by evening. That's a great news indeed, sir. I will inform the parent on our update. Oh no. Where did I end up into? I just wanted to bully that girl for fun. I messed hard with my life. So, this is how a small act of sharing pictures online, can lead us into big trouble. It is always recommended to not share private or sensitive information online, to any random stranger. So, until the next time, be alert, and be aware. That indeed was a good effort to spread the awareness to the general public. I thank and of course congratulate the team for their efforts. If you make customers unhappy in the physical world, they might tell six friends. If you make customers unhappy on the internet, they can each tell 6,000 friends. With that note, I would now ask Dr. Balaji Rajendra, Associate Director, CDAC, to address the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, can I share the screen? Yes, sir. Is the screen visible? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So this is a session on. Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction and the background of the program in, uh, given by the other uh, dignitary members and as also as well as the beautiful animation film that was shown. So uh, this is one. Uh, uh, this session is will help you in understanding what is electronic trust and what factors are essential for uh, electronic trust. And the most fundamental element for achieving electronic trust is a digital signature. So what uh, in this session, we will see how it all works together. Okay, so that is the objective of this session. So with that uh, basic introduction, let me get into the session directly because the time available for me is very less actually, I'm only given 30 minutes. So let me try and uh, cover as much as possible. <clears throat> so first let us see that, uh, uh, let me just give a very traditional uh, comparison between a physical document and the electronic document. So in a physical document, uh, the uh, attack on integrity can happen. Okay. So uh, when I say integrity, somebody after you have uh, typed and signed it, somebody can alter the content or somebody can uh, uh, change the signatures or add something and things like that or forge your signature. All these things can happen. Ma'am, anything you want to say? Madam, am I audible? Hello? Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, fine. Yeah. So then, uh, attack on identity. So this is one thing where uh, uh, somebody tried to impersonate you. So yeah, somebody has looked at your signature, they want to try to copy your signature and impersonate you. So the process of verifying a person's signature against a specific signature is called authentication in the physical world. See, when you present a check, uh, the, uh, the banker or the person who is in, in the bank will verify the signature in the check with the specimen signature of that uh, uh, the same person who when he enrolled as a customer in the bank. The two signature matches, then only you process the check. So this process is basically called authentication. Okay, And uh, this terminology of authentication is being carried forward in the electronic world also. Now let me show you a small example. What difference do you see between these two? Do you see any difference? There is one small e difference between the first one as well as the right hand side. Am I right? Not approved became not approved. Okay. So that is one thing. Then second thing. So this is basically called an attack on the integrity of the document. So here can you see one small difference between the two documents? There is a difference between one zero here. Okay. 6,000 has become 60,000. Okay. So of course, these are all only for examples. So in the electronic world also, the same problems can persist. Okay. Attack. It's not that the electronic world is foolproof. Here also problems are there. So when A wants to talk to B, okay. So when A wants to talk to B, obviously uh, an intermediary fellow can come in the picture and then they can try to see what is happening. Okay. So we have to protect this communication between A. Second thing is when two people are communicating in an office scenario, the data is actually traversing through several servers and several uh, networking equipments. So an attacker can come in the middle and can try to see what the communication is all about. So data theft can happen. Then a message can be altered. Okay. So for example, if a message is about depositing one lakh rupees in a person's account, the attacker can come in the middle and can probably change the values. Okay. He can divert the fund. So all these things can happen and we have to ensure that these things are not happening. And one more interesting and important thing is, 
nowadays we are all working from work from home scenarios now let us say that the attacker just in this example we can call him as gabbar uh, gabbar knows that jay and viru are working in the same organization and that they are working for a work from home scenario so now gabbar sends a mail to viru sorry gabbar sends a mail to jay saying pretending to be viru asking him to send some confidential communication now jay if he does not have a mechanism of whether the messages really come from viru or not he will be just be trapped by the messages from gabbar and he will be sending all the confidential information so jay should have a proper mechanism for verifying whether the mail has really originated from viru or not so this is a big challenge and this challenge exists even today okay so basically in these examples what we have to understand is when two people are communicating we have to ensure that nobody else is able to know what these two people are communicating that is called confidentiality or secrecy only those two people should be aware of what they are communicating with so that policy or that principle is called confidentiality okay so that is one thing then second thing is basically authenticity so authenticity is what do you mean by authenticity is suppose if i am communicating with you you should be sure that i should be sure that i am communicating really with you and similarly you should also be sure that you are communicating with me so when a is communicating with b a should be sure that a is really communicating with b and b is also very sure that he is really communicating with a and not somebody who is pretending to be a. so that is called authenticity mutual authentication is required third thing is integrity when two people are communicating it should be very much sure that nobody is coming and altering the content of the document so that is called integrity the last one is basically non repudiation so when we say non repudiation you should uh, this is little tricky in the sense that suppose if i have done something in the online world i should not be able to go back and deny that later okay so that is called non repudiation ensuring that i am unable to deny whatever i have done that is called non repudiation okay so these four properties are essential for assuring trust in a system okay for assuring trust in a system so privacy authenticity integrity and non repudiation are the four elements or four properties which are to be assured in any electronic transaction okay and we have to ensure that uh, this is taken care of and as of today the only technology that supports or assures you all these four properties is called as public key infrastructure pki there is no other technology which is currently existing which can assure you all the four properties in a very reliable and acceptable way to all the parties okay, so that is the thing and public key infrastructure is a technology which has been existing in the world for more than 30 years now okay so it's not a new technology but its adoption has been only increasing and ease of use has been increasing for a long time now so when i say public key infrastructure it is not only a pure technology it is also about the uh, the standards which have been defined okay so that anyone can trust or use the system then also it is about the policy okay see if we need policies and laws to somebody to violate to catch hold of the violators of the technology or violators of the uh, this thing so policy and laws are very much important the last one is basically implementation the technology as such should be implemented okay should be implemented uh, uh, as application because that is how the end users realize them okay so pki public key infrastructure is basically uh, not a pure technology solution technology solution it is also a mixture of technology policy implementation and standards okay so first let me uh, go and uh, illustrate or describe what is a digital signature is a digital signature is nothing but uh, it's a value it's a value which is derived from a secret which is known only to you and a digital fingerprint of the message which is being sent please remember that i just have to clear the illusion that when you when i say digital signature people think that it is a scan of your uh, signature handwritten signature no it is not okay that is only the appearance of the signature 
okay when we say digital signature it is a value mathematical value okay which is derived from a secret which is known only to you and based on a digital fingerprint of the message which is being signed okay so right now just hold these two things in your mind i will just illustrate in the period of time in a moment of time so in uh, digital signatures can assure you authenticity integrity and non repetition so what are the four properties that we are saying for trust we are talking about confidentiality authenticity integrity and non repetition but digital signature can give assure you three properties authenticity integrity and non repetition confidentiality is not required because say for example i am sending some message to you okay so i am digitally signing that message means i want it to be verified okay so confidential we can whenever required we can bring it in later but as far as now we just stick with these three properties digital signatures can assure you only these three authenticity integrity and non repetition okay so now first thing is uh first the secret how do you get the how do you uh, achieve a secret because i said that a digital signature is something which is based on your secret say first let us understand why do we need a secret so for example in the case of a handwritten word in the physical document you are putting your signature physical all right it is your signature that you are applying okay your handwritten signature is there now what is the uh, issue with that is nobody can try to replicate the signature so even if you simply write a b c it is extremely difficult for any third party to write a b c in the same style as you have written because the curves that you use the strokes that you apply the pressure that you apply on the pen is extremely difficult for any third party to replicate okay even a person sees you how you write a b c it is very difficult to do it in the same way in a moment of time of course for people who try to cheat you they take several hours of practice and then they try to they may try to do it in a similar way but then that also can be caught by a trained eye okay so how this has happened is this got the right the way of writing a b c that whatever your signature may be got imbibed in your dna okay so it is extremely difficult for anybody to do that even though they may be your uh, uh, twins or brothers or sisters or even your children nobody will be able to replicate your signature exactly okay so this is the issue so now what we have to do is so this same concept we need to bring it in the real world also so how do you bring it in the real world in the real world Uh, sorry in the digital world we also need to emulate it how will you emulate in the digital world digital world we are saying that you have to have some secret okay so how do you have some secret with you so for example i can have some secret like let us say numbers as a secret okay some number let us say a small number like 22 9 okay so then i can try to do something but that will not work out okay because you should have some secret and it should not be known to the third person but at the same time i should be able to verify that you are the owner of that secret so this is the challenge okay basically what i am trying to say is now let us say that you are having some number which is with you okay which you are not going to reveal to anybody okay and you are doing some operation on using that particular value and i should know that you are the holder of that secret but at the same time i should not know that you are the uh, owner of that i i should not know your secret okay so this is a big challenge which is uh, posed in the problem of cryptography okay so uh what we do is we go into the form of uh, uh prime numbers big prime numbers okay uh, we have some sort something called as a key here okay we call this numbers as keys okay so now what we do is as every uh, user you have something called as a private key okay you have something called as a private key okay which is known only to you okay which is a secret which is known only to you okay which is a big number okay do not take a small number it should be at least 150 digit plus okay then there should be another key which will automatically should be derived from the private key or whatever it may be it's called as a public key and which can be distributed to anybody and everybody okay now the magical uh, 
uh, just please listen carefully the magical uh, the magic happens here okay the private key and public key are in such a way that they are mathematically related with each other okay they are mathematically related with each other now assume some sort of lock which you have okay assume some sort of lock which you have now in this lock let us say that if you are using private key for locking okay then you cannot use the same private key for unlocking you have to use the corresponding public key for unlocking okay so that is a scenario just imagine a lock where you can use your private key for locking but you have to use the public key for unlocking okay you cannot use the same key for both locking as well as unlocking traditionally what we do is we take a key and use both uh, meaning uh, we mean the key is used for both locking as well as unlock but in this scenario what we are doing is we are using different keys okay pair of keys that is if you lock it with private key then you have to unlock with public key okay and vice versa also is true that is if you are locking with the public key then you have to unlock with the private key okay so this is one of the thing so if one of the key in a key pair is used for encryption then the other key that is a private key is used for decryption okay so that is the thing so this you have to remember it very well so based on this further under this understanding we will go and try to understand further Clear this. Okay. To digitally sign a document, the signer uses his or her private key and verifier. Basically, when you digitally sign a document, the verifier will use your public key. Okay, the signer's public key. Okay, that is very important. The signer's public key is being used. Okay, the signer's public key is being used. now whatever we discussed is basically called as asymmetric cryptography i am not going to go into more into math but i am just going to tell you what is the basic concept the very very basic concepts of it so now you may be wondering that i told you that uh, public key can be shared with everybody and anybody uh, anybody and everybody i private key i said that you have to keep it secret and these two keys that is public key as well as private key are are uh, Uh, related with each other, mathematically related with each other. So now you may be wondering, if you are distributing your public key to the whole world, how can uh, a person who is holding your public key will not be able to find out your private key because they are mathematically related? It's a question that may crop up in your mind. Okay. So what I am going to say is, I am going to say it is not impossible, but I am going to tell you that it is. Uh, it is going to be. computationally infeasible okay so that is what i am going to do that is what i mean to say is if you are having a public key and you want to find the private key of the person it is not impossible there are algorithms but you need a huge computational power okay in today's standards of 4096 bit key you need at least 50 plus years of computational power unless there is a quantum computer comes into picture and you basically you need a super computer which needs to run for 50 plus years continuous which is not going to be worthwhile for doing okay you know the cost of supercomputing and you know how much power and energy it is going to consume and 50 plus years of consumption is going to take a huge amount of time and effort so to find out yes there is a way but it is not feasible computationally it is impossible to derive a private key from a given public key okay so this is very important to understand so now when i am talking about keys i am actually talking about this kind of numbers basically which are great uh, bigger numbers which are represented in some notation okay so that is what we have done now to reinforce the concepts let me uh, tell you the same thing let us say that there is a piece of text with us and if i have to encrypt it then i have to use let us say i am using the private key for i am using the public key for encryption okay then it provides me encrypted text and now what should i do is i should 
use the private key for decrypting. Okay, I should use the private key for decryption. Okay, so that is the thing I need to do. Then, uh, next thing is suppose now let us say that I am encrypting the private key, then I have to use the public key for decryption. Okay, I have to use the alternate key. Okay, I cannot use the same key. Say, for example, if I am encrypting the public key, trying to decrypt with the same public key, it will not work, it will fail. If I am trying to encrypt with the private key and trying to decrypt with the same private key, it will not work. Okay, so this will fail. Okay, so this is one thing we need to understand. Now, let us go to the next step, which is involved in digital sign. First thing we need to do is, whenever a message which we have to digitally sign, we need to use the cryptographic hashing algorithm. Okay, cryptographic hashing algorithm, which will produce a fingerprint of the message. Okay, so this will produce a fingerprint of the message. Okay. See, you might have heard the word fingerprint several times. So, what is fingerprint? Fingerprint is a unique representation. Am I right? It's a unique representation of an individual. Nobody, uh, no two persons in the world have identical fingerprints. Though they may, uh, they may be closely related or even co joined twins also, the fingerprints will be different. Okay. So, fingerprints are unique to a person. Okay. That is number one. Second thing is just imagine this one scene. You are in a crime scene. You are seeing the fingerprint of some uh, probable uh, criminal or whoever it is. Uh, so, what you do is you take the copy of the fingerprint. And by using the fingerprint, can you build a picture of the person who was involved in the crime? It is impossible. Am I right? Basically, what you have to do is you would have already had some database of fingerprints and then you have to run this fingerprint which are you collected in the crime scene with the fingerprints in the database and then match it and then find out probably who might be the criminal who might have done that particular crime. Okay, So this is the uh, mechanism. So by using a fingerprint, you cannot uh, bring out the person. Okay, You cannot actually uh, you will not be able to uh, uh, draw the picture or bring out the person directly. You are trying to make some assumptions, you are doing some comparison of fingerprint to fingerprint and then you are finding out who the person could be. Okay, so this is the scenario. So same thing is involved here also. Okay, so here what are we going to do is here basically there is a uh, information which is basically there that is which are to be digitally signed. So what we do is mathematically there is a something an algorithm which is called as a cryptographic hashing algorithm which is widely used today. Okay, in uh, knowingly or unknowingly everybody is using. Even when you are even using a password, you are using this algorithm. Okay, from blockchains to everywhere this is being widely used. Okay, so this algorithm that is being used that will generate a message directly. So if you pass on the message to cryptographic hashing algorithm, it generates a message directly, which is nothing but the digital fingerprint of the message. Okay. So now, please have a look at this example. What difference do you see between these two messages? There is one small dot at the right hand side. Okay. One dot is there. So that uh, this particular dot is giving you a totally different message. Okay, this dot actually gives you a totally different message. Okay, if you can look at this one, this is basically the fingerprints are totally different because of one small dot. Okay, so this is the algorithm that it can generate a fingerprint of a given message. Now let us say instead of the dot, there is one blank space is there then also you will totally get a different value. Okay, So this is an interesting property of the cryptographic hashing algorithm. Now, these are one-way algorithm. What do you mean by one-way is, from a fingerprint you cannot bring a, meaning reconstruct a person's 
image or something like that. Similarly, by using a fingerprint of a message, you will not be able to reconstruct the message back. Okay, so that is why we say it is a one-way algorithm. So what do we mean by that is, if there is a fingerprint and I'm passing to a uh, cryptographic caching algorithm, I will not be able to get the original message. Instead, I will be only getting a, another fingerprint. Okay, because this is this has become a this has become basically a message here, input message to the cryptographic caching algorithm, which produces another uh, um, the, another fingerprint. Okay, so that is what has happened. Okay, so this we need to understand. Next is. Uh, yeah, hash function is basically a cryptographic mechanism that operates as a one-way function. And very interesting thing about this one is it produces a fixed size output. So what do you mean by a fixed size output? Whatever the size of the input may be, the output size is going to be the same. The input size can of the hashing algorithm, the input text can be anything. Okay, input can be one character or even billions of characters or even several GBs or TBs also. But output is only going to be 256 bits. Okay, we say binary digits or something like that. Or 256 bits means 256 bits, 512 means 512 bits. Okay, any small change in the input message will produce a different digest. Okay, there are several lashing algorithms which are available. So, have a look at this. Okay. These are different algorithms. Any small input change will produce a totally different uh, algorithm output. And not only that, uh, there are different algorithms are there. SHA-2512 is the latest algorithm that everybody uses. Okay, whatever the size of the input, the output will be 512 bits. Okay. Now the second step in digital signing is you have generated a fingerprint of the message. Now what you have to do is you have to encrypt the message digest with the private key, with your private key, okay? So you are having your private key. So now you need to encrypt the message digits with your private key and that produces a digital signature. That produces a digital signature, okay? So finally, you append the digital signature to the message and then it becomes a digitally signed message, okay? So now let me just show you in a pictographical way now let us say that you are the composer of the message, you compose the message. Now what you do is you take a copy of the message, pass it to the cryptographic hashing algorithm and then your message digest is generated. Now what you do, you encrypt the message digest. Please remember, I am encrypting the message digest, not the message. Okay. And I am generating a digital signature. This digital signature is now added to the message and then sent to the receiver. Okay. So let me once again uh, do that. The sender is composing the message. A copy of the message is being passed to the cryptographic hashing algorithm. From the hashing algorithm, you are generating a fingerprint of the message, that is message digest. Now what you do is you encrypt the message digest with your private key. Okay, So with your private key, you are encrypting the message digest. So now that produces a digital signature. Okay, that produces a digital signature. Okay, so this digital signature is appended to the message and sent to the uh, receiver. Okay, so please remember that we are not actually encrypting the message, we are only encrypting the fingerprint that you have generated. Okay, so that is the thing. And now that will go to the receiver. So now receiver receives a message along with the digital signature that you have done and he receives it. So now he has to verify that you have really signed this message or not. So now what he does is he takes out the content of the message. Okay. He takes out the content of this message and sends it to the cryptographic caching algorithm and generates a message digest. Okay. So this he keeps it aside. Now let us say left hand side or something like that. Okay, so this is computed by the verifier. Now, the second part is the digital signature. The digital signature is decrypted with the signer's public key. Okay, 
this is decrypted with the signer's public key. So already this is encrypted with, why I'm saying is this is actually locked with the signer's private key. So for unlocking what you should do, you should use the signer's public key. So if you are doing it, if you are decrypting with the signer's public key, what will you get? You will get the message that is which was computed by the signer of the message. Okay. Now let us assume that this is RHS right hand side. If both the messages are equal, then what it means is the message is really originated from the claimed signer only because the private key is with him. So it has really come from him only. That is one thing. Second thing is no change has happened in the transmission process. Because as we have seen that if there is even a small change, that the entire hash value will totally different. The digest value will be totally different. So the integrity is preserved. So authentication and integ integrity are 100 percent guaranteed. Okay. So this is very important. Non-reparation will come to it in a moment of time. Okay. So let me explain this again pictorially. You have received a message. Okay. So this message and digital signature are received by a receiver. Now what he, had, what he has to do is he has to take only the message part of the message. Okay. And then pass it to the cryptographic caching algorithm and generate the message register and keep it as a, okay. Then take out the digital signature component. Okay. Now this has to be decrypted with the signers public key. This will be decrypted with the signers public key. Okay. Why we are using signers public key? Because he used his private key. Okay. Signers private key was used for encrypting or generating his digital signature. So therefore we are using the signers public key. If you are using the signers public key, we will get the message digest, which was actually which was basically computed by the signer. If the message edges was computed by the signer and the message edges currently received from the current message, if both are same, then the message integrity is preserved. And moreover, the message has really been signed by the signer only because we have used the signer's public key. And what does that mean? That means the signer has really signed this message using his private key. Therefore, the signer is responsible for these actions and authenticity is proved, integrity is also proved. If in a case that both the messages are not equivalent, there is a discrepancy, we have to simply discard the message and ask the signer to resend the message. That's it. Okay. So this is about the verification of the digital signature. So, here are some samples to just to give a uh, feeling of what how a digital signature looks like. So if there is a message like this, digital signature is looking like this. So have a close look at the last two examples. What difference do you see? Because of one change in the E, that is capital E has been substituted with a small e. You get a totally different signature here. Okay. So unlike a traditional handwritten signature, see, you do not change your signature when you are signing a document or when you are signing an attendance record or when you are signing a, a property document or whatever it means. You always keep it with the same, uh, this thing only. So digital signatures are both signer and content different. Okay. Digital signatures are signer and content different. Unlike handwritten signatures, which are only dependent on the signer, Digital signature is both signer and content. So if you digitally sign these messages, you will get a different value because your private key will be different from mine. Okay. That is one. Second thing is content. It, this is tied to the content also. So you can see that any small change in the content will have a totally different digital signature. Okay. So that is one important thing. So a quick recap of whatever I covered. So digital signature is nothing but a value derived from the digital fingerprint of the message plus the signer secret and digital signature, signature establishes the identity and authenticity of the signer, integrity of the document and non-repudiation to a certain extent. You may be worry, wondering why I did not say full extent. I'll tell you in a moment why. Uh, so the general convention is whenever you are signing, you have to use your private key and whenever you are verifying, you have to use the public key. When you are, if you over-sign, that particular person's uh, prior public key has to be used for 
verification. Okay. Now, first, let me say that uh, why uh, the non repudiation was not um, uh, there to a full extent. Now, just imagine like this that I am sending a digitally signed message to you, okay, and you acted upon the message. Later, uh, for some reason, you say that uh, because of my instructions, you acted upon the message. I am saying no, I have not sent that digitally signed message. Now, what you might tell me is that no, 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 you have previously digitally signed these messages using your uh, this key, your public key is this one. I use the same public key for verification. Therefore, you only had signed it and sent to me. This is what you will argue. I will simply say that my private key has been compromised. So I had kept it somewhere, somebody misused it. I am no more using that private keys. My private key has been stolen and misused or something like that. Now, how will you hold me responsible for the keys that I hold? Okay. You are not supposed to know what is my private key or secret is, but you should also know that I am responsibly holding those keys. Okay. For this is the biggest reason uh, and it basically, basically requires a legal uh, support system for supporting this. Okay. So for this thing, you have the concept of certificates here. Okay. Uh, that is the thing. So what is the certificate? Uh, uh, what does a certificate mean? Certificate is basically will assure you, will give some sort of assurance. Okay. So here also we are talking about a dig, uh, uh, digital signature certificate. Okay. So DSC here will help us in establishing the ownership of the public. Okay. And this will certify and provide a strong mechanism for non repetition. Okay. So what does a certificate generally you do? Certificate tells that the name of the person and what is the degree and things like that. Similarly, here also the certificate is going to tell who is the person and what is their public keys. We do not have to certify the private key because private key and public key are bond together. Okay. They are interrelated with each other. Private key, you can always keep it secret. Okay. But if I certify the public key, automatically your private key also becomes indirectly certified. You keep it yourself in. So what is this certificate? This certificate is basically an electronic document containing the ownership information of the public. Who is the owner and what is the name of the person? What is his public that will be told. But then who can give you this DSC? Who can give you this certificate? Can I give myself? If I give myself, then nobody can be trusted. So or if I let us say that if uh, my colleague gives for me a certificate and I certify my colleague, then also there won't be uh, trust by a third party. So what happens is we have to rely on a third party. Okay. With all, everyone can trust. Everyone should be able to trust that third party. The good thing is, uh, the concept is basically the third party is called as a certifying authority in this uh, terminology called PKI. Okay. So these are the third party. They, when I say CA, it's not chartered accountant. Please remember that this is certifying authority. These people give you or issue a certificate, digital signature certificate to you. Okay. So it is a trusted third party. And they are the pillars of the public infrastructure. They give you a certificate and tell you what is your public. Okay. Of course, they will not give you a public key immediately. They will have to verify your credentials. You have to give a PAN card or whatever ID, whatever it may be. Based on that, they issue a certificate. And they also revoke the certificate. Revocation can happen at two points of time. Revocation can happen whenever your private, you say that your private key has been compromised then they can revoke the certificate. Okay, so at that point, nobody will trust you. Second thing is nobody will trust your certificate or document, digitally signed. Or uh, if they find out that some false information has been produced and that they have to revoke the certificate, then also they will revoke the certificate. Okay, so this is one thing. And last thing is basically, uh, 
uh, these things has to be maintained online. Okay, so when because suppose if I am receiving a digitally signed a document, I have to be sure whether there is a real uh, the certificate is valid or not. Okay, so that needs I need to go and check whether the certificate is valid or not. So the issuer of the certificate there is basically the CA. So they have something called as a CR certificate revocation list. Okay, so they have something called as a certificate revocation list. This will contain the revoked certificate list. If your certificate is in this list, that means it is revoked and it is no longer to be trusted. Okay, if the certificate is not there in this list, then I can trust it. Okay, so this job is basically by certifying process. In India, we have a very beautiful uh, system in place for more than twenty plus years now. In India, we have an organization uh, called Controller of Certifying Authority (CCA). Okay. So this is established by the government of India through an act in the Indian Parliament in the year 2000. So now, what is their job? Is they give licenses to the certifying authorities. Okay, so they give licenses to the certifying authorities. Now, certifying authorities, after verification of our credentials, they issue a DSC, that is Digital Signature Certificate. So now. I can go to one of the any CA and I can get India any any CA recognized by CCA and I can get a DSC. Uh, Rega Madam can get a certificate from uh, a certificate from another CA, but recognized by CCA. But both can trust each other. Why? Because both are anchored and trusted by CCA. Because uh, Madam also trusts government of India. I also trust government of India. Okay. Because this is a central. Uh, body or central institution which is established in India. So this is the mechanism which is existing in India, and this is uh, organization actually exists through an act in the Parliament from the year 2000. So digital signatures have been valid in the Indian Court of Law from the year 2000. Okay, so this is a very interesting thing. I hope uh, some of you might be surprised to know it. Yet. So. When I say a certificate, this is how the certificate will look like. Okay, uh, so you can see the certificate here, the certificate which has been issued to me, and then you are also looking at, uh, at the my public key. Okay, so this is basically my public key. Okay, of course this will not uh, uh, show your private key here. Okay, even if you scroll, it will not be visible. You can only see the public key. Okay. Private key is there inside it, but it will be kept separately and secret. Okay. Generally, it will ask you for a PIN for sure uh, for the knowing about the private key. Okay. So this is how it is. The public key is there. So this is what I told about uh, the trust model in India, where uh, the CCA is there at the center, and. Uh, Uh, we have the license to CEs, certifying authorities, and we are nothing but the sub. We are nothing but the users or end users, and nothing but subscribers basically. So we can go and get certificate from any of these organizations or agencies. Okay. So this is my certificate. I got a certificate from one of the CEs here. That particular CE is recognized by. CCA, that is this particular organization, which is a government of India organization. Certificate issuance process. So I just go online, I make the payment, I fill my information, show my proofs that I am Balaji and all those things, and they issue me a crypto token. Okay, so crypto token will be something uh, uh, like this, something like this. This is a crypto token. Okay, so it looks like exactly like a pen drive, but does not. It's not a pen drive. Okay, so it will contain the pair of keys, private key and the public key, and uh, of course my public key will be certified by the certifying authority, and then it will be given to me. Okay, so uh, and I said crypto token. It is actually having a cryptographic co-processor also. Okay, it is having a cryptographic co-processor also. So. This is uh, 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 this processor is actually sealed with a black uh, seal. So basically, it is a tamper resistant. So if somebody tries to do some magnetic 
uh, interference to see what could be the keys or things like that. Nobody will be able to get it because there is a seal. And if they have to break the seal, then the chip will also get destroyed. So this is the thing. But this uh, crypto token, which is in USB form, can be used in any machine. Okay, so it is actually machine independent. Okay, and tamper system. And my private key is there. So whenever my access to my private key is required, so whenever we are digitally signing a document, access to the private key is required. At that time, we will be prompted for the PIN. Okay, so we'll be prompted for the PIN. So at that time, PIN will be given. So this is something similar to like your ATM card. Whenever you want to use your ATM card, give your PIN similarly here. So there are types of certificate also. Whatever I covered you right now is called as a DS, that is digital signing certificate. Now we also have something called as a encryption certificate. Okay. So I want to use encryption, then I have to get a something called as a different certificate, which is called encryption certificate. Then third thing is basically called SSL or TLS certificate. This is issued to a domain name. Okay. And uh, domain name like let us say cdac.in and or uh, uh, your college name. So this will be installed in your web servers or email servers. Okay, so these are certificates which are uh, obtained and provide you security for the servers and domain names. Okay, your certificate lifecycle management is you can keep using um, the certificates. Uh, uh, meaning you cannot use the certificates forever. Basically, you can use it until renewal, use until rekeying, and use until revocation. Okay, so that is the thing. And uh, CRL basically is uh, a list which is maintained by the certifying authority, okay, uh, which contains the serial number of the certificates. And uh, the CRLs are maintained by the certifying authority, okay. So uh, that is the thing. Uh, the CRLs are updated uh, by the certifying authority uh, twice in a day, okay, and things like that. And uh, the uh, whenever you are receiving a digital signed document, it is not sufficient for you to verify the digital signature, but you also have to verify the certificate also. That it does only if you verify the certificate, because I just showed you how do I verify the document, the signature, but it's not enough, but you also have to verify the certificate also. If the certificate is valid, then only you should further go ahead and accept the document. Okay. Of course, verification of the hash values are very important, but uh, apart from that, certificate validity is also very important. If the certificates are invalid, then there is no point in trusting the uh, signatures. You can just go ahead and ignore it. Okay. So these are the two uh, layers which are there. And finally, of course, if you are having a crypto token, you have to keep it safely and securely. And uh, this is the thing. And there are risks also, meaning in the sense if you compromise, if you get your lose your crypto token, then you have to inform the certifying authority. So risks are there in every system. So that's it. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, you can look at the uh, videos from our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash PKI India, where we have a number of uh, videos and uh, programming uh, code also available. And also, of course, we have other uh, social media outlets where you can reach us. So thank you. And if there is any questions, I can take it up. Thank you, sir. Your thoughts on various attacks in the digital world, their eff effect on integrity in the corporate world, and information on digital signature did help us reach a milestone high in our goal. Privacy with medical information is a fallacy. If everyone's information is out there, it's a part of the collective. Now may I request Dr. Muhammad Misbahuddin, Associate Director, CCAT, to address the session. Over to you, sir.
uh, I just uh, really just uh, take some control to share my Word document here. Okay, so I'm just saying this is a test document. So digital sign in. Just typing this. Wait to save this. Test. Okay, and now I'm going to use my crypto token. So now what is going to happen is I'm going to digitally sign this document. So Microsoft has this facility, Word document has this facility. So I can do something, create and upload this document. Purpose for signing this document, I can give some information, test. And I'm signing this, going to sign this document as Balaji Rajendran myself. And a certificate has been issued to me by one of the certifying authorities, Safe Scriptia. So now I'm going to digitally sign this. See, when I am, what happened is, now, first of all, there is a, a message digest or the fingerprint of this document has been generated. After that, this fingerprint has been encrypted with my private key. So my private key is being inside the crypto token, which I have put in the system. Okay. So now uh, my private key is inside this crypto token. So whenever my private key has to be accessed, it will ask me for my pin as I showed you in the slides. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give my see. So now you can see that it says that your uh, signature has been successfully saved with this document. The document has changed, your signature will become invalid. Okay, so that's the thing. So here you can see this Word document here, and here one uh, icon also appears here. You can see here that this document has been digitally signed on uh, 28th uh, January, that is today's date. Yes. You can look at the details of the signature also. Okay. And you can also go and see the certificate, my certificate, which was used for digital signature. Details of my certificate, you can have a look at my public key also. Then finally, my the path of the certification. So I've been issued by a certificate by uh, safe script sub CA and their sub, uh, subscript CA is also available and then the root that is basically CCA in there. So I can actually view all of these people's certificate also. It also gets added to the document. Okay. So safe script sub CA, you can look at it. That's a uh, they have been issued a certificate by safe script CA and safe script CA has been issued a certificate by CCA India. Okay. And CCA India is the root of the hierarchy. Their certificate will be self issued by them. Okay. So issued to and issued from the same. Okay, so because they are from government of India and they are at the root. Okay, so this is the scenario. So this is how it all works. So I hope I can equip them also. I will show you. So any questions? Is a private key can be often changed, sir? Uh, no, as long as you, because then you have to change the certificate also. Yeah. You can change it, but uh, you have to change your certificate also every time. You need to so what will be the validity of your certificate? Once they are, the certificate authority issues you the... Uh, generally the one year, one year, one year, one year, generally. One year. Yeah. Okay. So then as like other uh, details and we have to, you know, keep on... Uh, Renewing our certificates. Yeah, exactly. You have to keep on renewing your certificate. Okay. So that's it. Uh, sir, can we have multiple certificates? Yes, sir. Uh, you like can have any number of you can have my any number of uh, certificates. Uh, you can uh, because say for example, uh, you can use a certificate which you are going to use only in your uh, uh, college. Another thing, you can use it for your personal uh, income tax filings and things like that. So if every place can have multiple, uh, uh, you, uh, meaning you can have multiple certificates for different purposes. Can we edit, sir? Because see, uh, presently I have uh, digital signature. Uh, so I'm using it for past two years. Yeah. I have uh, closing my LLP company and I'm uh, registering a new company. 
Okay. And I want it for proprietorship. Can I edit it? Is it possible through the agency or else, uh, because I have taken for more than two years? Or uh, no, else no, should I take a new signature? Be better to go for a new certificate, sir. Why? Because uh, you are closing the LLP. At that time, I don't know whether you got class three or not. Class three means your organization name also might be there. And, yes, yes, organization uh, name is there, there sir. Uh, because then, now uh, it is mandated, no? GST for yes, GST yes, is mandated. Correct. I know it is mandatory for MCI, I know that. That's why it was asking you. So now you have to go for a new certificate only, sir. New certificate. Yes. Mm. And that device is useless, sir, after that, because uh, there are more than uh, five directors. The five device is ah. useless now. No, and every device. Every, uh, every uh, user will get a different device, sir. Same device in, in our. Sir, the device after validity, after like if you are changing something or after validity, that is that device useless or how is it? We need to throw it or also, sir. Can uh, we reuse it? No, you can reuse it. Say, for example, it may not be really thrown out. And again, when you're going for a new certificate, you can get the uh, certificate reinstalled in the. Uh, okay, uh, I need same. to give this device to the CA so that they will reinstall it. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to even give them. Basically, they can uh, help you to do a software uh, uh, thing and then they can do to reinstall it. That they will do. Right. Okay. And other thing, uh, can we carry it portable, sir? Uh, for example, uh, I will leave uh, my signatures always with the device with the CA. Uh, whereas okay. sometimes, uh, if I want to apply for e tenders, uh, because I am also applying e tenders with HL, BHL. Uh, so, uh, uh, can is it possible for me to carry uh, uh, separately in a, in, a, in a hard disk? Is it possible? No, sir. You, because your private key will always be within the crypto token only, and you cannot actually. Uh, uh, you have to carry this token, this pen drive, whatever it looks like. Can a, I have a multiple token with the same name? Two two tokens, two signatures. Keys will be different. I give it up to see, and I can carry it with myself one. Yeah. You can have actually. Okay. Thank but CA in the sense, I, I you are talking about certifying authority or a chartered accountant, sir? Yeah. Chartered accountant, sir, because they will be filing the GST and they will be maintaining the. No, 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 no. That is that is a very important thing which I want to tell you. That is, you should never give your crypto token to anybody. Uh, oh. Because that uh, because it is something like you giving your signature, you are signing on a white blank paper. Yes, yes, yeah. Giving your crypto right, so token to somebody is like giving a, uh, a signing in a blank paper and giving that. So you should never ever give it to them. So wherever required, you have to just apply the signature. Uh, some sort of uh, is it layers of security. Uh, uh, those type of websites are called as deep web. Whereas another layer of web is called as dark web, which will not be accessed even through the search engines. If you search in Google or if you search in any other uh, search engines, you will not be able to access those web uh, URLs, those websites. You may need to go through or kind of a browsers, Onion, the Onion routers, these kind of websites or browsers through which you have to enter the direct URL that the people give you. So mostly the dark web is uh, infamous or it is uh, known uh, among the people as an illegal market for drugs, for drug dealing and sharing or selling of, uh, uh, I mean, hacked information and all. So all those illegal things happens on dark web. So there are, these are the three surfaces, three layers of web. One is called interesting thing to note is that uh, only 4% of the web comprises of the surface web, whereas 90% of the web comprises of deep web, whereas 6% of the web comprises of dark web. That means, so, I mean, the surface web is just 4%, while the dark web is 6%, okay, 6% of the dark web is there. That is really uh, alarming and that is very, really surprising to note. Now, if you look at uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the issues that are happening these days, I mean, in India, so the recent incidents that have happened, uh, identity theft is one of the most widely uh, used method for fooling the people by the criminals, by the cyber criminals. So identity theft. I mean, if you look at the recent news, identity theft, the biggest cyber security threat in India, 2.7 affected in 2020. Okay. And 83% of Indian consumers concerned about identity theft. Cyber criminals is told it is 1.2 trillion, trillion, so big number. Okay, 1.2 trillion from Indians in 2000. 
19, the survey says that four in 10 Indian adults have experienced identity theft. So identity theft kind of attacks have increased or multifold, I can say. And apart from that, the other uh, recent incidents related to the data or related to the data theft is beware. Your PAN, Aadhaar cards can be sold for rupees 100. 100 GB of Indians' data are for sale on dark web. Okay, so so many uh, incidents that are happening in India, and every now and then you can see the news that is there uh, on the websites as well as in the newspapers. Okay, so all these are just few. All these are just few of the examples of uh, where actually we are heading to. Uh, see, one thing to note that uh, we should be happy that we are advancing very fast in adopting the technology. But at the same time, uh, the matter of concern is if people are not made aware of the pros and cons of using the technology or the way the technology is to be used for its benefit. So if you don't create the awareness about that, then people are going to become victims of these kind of uh, cyber crimes and that is what is happening right now in India. Okay, so it is... Uh, in Times of India news clip, which I am highlighting here, really through my cursor, if you see July 22, 2017, one cyber crime in India every 10 minutes. Okay. So now this is, we are in 2021, and due to pandemic, the number of cyber crimes had uh, multifold and it, 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 it increased rapidly because people were sitting at homes and then most of the transactions were happening online only. So that is where uh, we lost. Okay. So many cyber crimes have been increased since then. Now the question comes is, when you use the internet, what are the primary online risks we face? Okay, the primary online risks that we face are more majorly three. The first one is called as virus, second one is called as bomb, and third one is called as trojan. You might be thinking that these are very basics. Yes, I understand that these are basic, but these are still relevant. Okay, so virus, what, what do you mean by a virus? Virus is basically the software, but this software is created with a malicious intent. Okay, so the intent was to disrupt the systems or disrupt the communication or destroy the data or it's all the, all the modified intentions are there. And so the virus basically is a software where it is created with a bad intention to, 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 to create harm or harmful results for the users. Okay. So how, from where do we get the virus? There are various sources from where we can, we get the virus. Okay. Most, most uh, uh, widely known source of getting the virus is the free downloads. Like I'm downloading free antivirus application. I'm downloading free MS Office application. I'm downloading free software, free games and all that. Okay. So nothing comes for free in this world. That is what we need to understand. If someone is giving something for free to me, then obviously I, I doubt. I doubt because why he's giving for free to me? Because he's not my relative. He's not my friend. He's not known to me. But still, he is going to give me uh, these type of uh, applications for free, which otherwise uh, require some amount of money to be uh, paid. Okay, so these are the sources of virus. Okay, then coming to worms, what is worm? Worm is also a type of virus, but this virus, the worm virus, it has a capacity or capability of replicating itself. It creates its own copy. And then it, uh, it it disrupts the communication, whatever uh, whatever uh, malicious intent that they had behind that virus that it will do. So the difference, major difference between virus and a worm is something like fever and viral fever. Okay, if a virus is installed into my system, only my system will get infected. Whereas worm, a worm is a viral virus, I can say which if it, is, if it is installed, then first of all, it will disrupt my services. At the same time, it will affect or infect other machines as well on the same network. So that is what is wrong. Now, what is Trojan is a Trojan is a kind of virus, which from outside looks very genuine. But when you download and when you install, 
along with that so-called genuine application, a virus or a worm will get installed into my machine and I'll now never come to know. For example, if I am searching for free antivirus application and I'm downloading that free antivirus application, for me, I'm downloading the free antivirus application for, uh, for, for cleaning, for cleaning my system from viruses. But actually what I'm doing is I am create, I'm basically, uh, I'm, I'm also downloading a spyware or an adware or some other malware, I'm downloading it, which I'm not aware also. When I download that, when I download that, what will happen is uh, when I install that antivirus, automatically along with that antivirus, this spyware will also get installed and I'll never know what has happened. Okay, so these are the three major online risks and threats that are uh, there present day. Now, what do you mean by a cyber crime? A cyber crime is nothing but any unlawful activity where cyberspace is used as a tool, target, or both. What do you mean by this cyberspace? I'll tell you. If the definition is something like this, for example, any unlawful activity where a knife is used as a tool, where a knife is used as a target, where a knife is used as a tool as well as target, that is both. So then you understand that, okay, using the knife is okay, but using that knife unlawfully or illegally leads to a crime. Similarly, when I use a cyberspace to carry out any unlawful activity, and this cyberspace is used as a tool or target or both, then that particular activity is called as cybercrime. Okay. Now the question comes, what is a cyberspace? So to understand, cyberspace is any thing which has an electronic chip in it is called as a cyberspace. Anything which has an electronic chip in it is nothing but a cyberspace. This we need to understand. Okay. Now, the point is, uh, what do you mean by this anything? What are the examples? The example, one of the best examples is mobile phone. Okay. Or laptop or your PC, fully automatic washing machine, smart AC, smart refrigeration systems. So everything which comes under the tag of a smart, everything comes under cyberspace. So if someone uses that cyberspace as a tool for carrying out unlawful activity, will be taken as cyber crime. Okay, please remember that. This is a list of cyber crime, but this is not a complete list. It is just an indicative list, I'm saying. So many uh, different types of cyber crimes are already there. Few of the uh, few of these type of cyber crimes we'll discuss today in uh, today's session. Okay, so there are many types of cyber crime that are right now happening and people, I, I think if I remember correctly, uh, after the inauguration, Madam was uh, running a video on cyber bullying also. So that is also one of the examples of uh, cyber crime. Now, what is the cyber crime rate in India? So it is keeping on increasing. So, and this particular data is taken from National Crime Records Bureau. Okay, National Crime Records Bureau is uh, is an agency of Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. Now, from 2014 onwards, if you see, the number of cyber crimes are keeping on increasing. Okay, 2019, it was 59,000. 2020, it went up to 80,000 something. And 2021, it uh, went up to 12% more than the previous year, that is 2020. I have not updated the data here from NCRB. So, but that is the fact. Okay, so many crimes. Now, the, the question is, uh, I mean, you may get a doubt that uh, in Times of India report, that clip which I have shown you in, in my previous slide, so it was saying that one cyber crime is happening in India every 10 minutes. So that, mean, that means six cyber, cyber crimes every hour. Then multiply it by 24. So it must be more than this 59,000. Then how come this 59,000 is less? It is being shown here as a record. So please remember that National Crime Reports Bureau only covers or takes those type of crimes which are actually registered as FIR and then the case is investigated and people arrested or not arrested but at least investigated or at least recorded, registered uh, uh, in the form of an FIR. So those cases if you see are 59,807 into the 2019. Okay, otherwise the number of incidents that are happening 
So incidents and cases are different. So the registered cases will come only after incidents are reported to the police department. There are many people who are not interested to report also. Okay, they say that, okay, okay. There are various reasons. People don't know where to report or people say that we have never stepped into the police station. So it is against our family honor. So we don't want to go to the police station. So there are various reasons that people don't want to register or report a cyber crime. But you can always report the cyber crimes on Government of India has uh, provided the facility called as www.cybercrime.gov.in website. Cybercrime.gov.in website. So you can directly go and then you can, if possible, you try to show you this. This one, cybercrime.gov.in website. So go to this particular website, National Cyber Crime Reporting Portal, and here you file a complaint. So you want to learn about cyber crime, you can learn here, or you can file a complaint here. Okay, so I accept, and then whatever types of, you want to report anonymously, or you want to report and track, report other cyber crimes and all. So cyber crime related to women and child, cyber crime, other cyber crimes. So various options are there. You can always look into this particular uh, website. Uh, suppose you've got for it if uh, you also become a victim of cyber crime. Okay, so we'll continue with the presentation now. So that is where you can uh, report the cyber crime. You can, you can register a cyber crime anonymously as well. Now, after delivering the sessions and uh, giving the trainings to n number of people, uh, one thing which came to my mind is let me focus on a couple of areas uh, which if we try to improvise on it, or, or I can say, as per my uh, uh, I mean, today's uh, talk's title, so if we follow the hygienic practices, cyber hygienic practices in these areas, then there is a possibility that we may not become a victim of a cyber crime. So uh, that is where these are the four areas we need to focus. One is identity, second one is password, third is mobiles, and so social engineering. Let me go to these topics one by one. I don't know whether time permits or not. So whatever uh, areas I can cover, I will try to cover all those areas. The first one is identity. Under identity, identity theft is one of the most important uh, area that we need to learn, create awareness about among the people. Okay, so identity theft is basically stealing someone's identity. So uh, as per the Information Technology Act 2000 and its amendment 2008, identity theft means uh, using someone else's uh, unique identification feature fraudulently or dishonestly. I'll repeat, fraudulently or dishonestly using someone else's electronic signature uh, password, PIN, or any other unique identification feature leads to identity theft. And identity theft means, suppose if it is proven that uh, identity theft is carried out by a particular person in the court of law, then that identity theft will attract three years jail. Okay. So under identity theft, uh, I mean, people may steal your Aadhaar related information, may steal your credit card information, debit card information, and they can carry out your ATM frauds and all that. I'll just briefly uh, tell you what has happened in the recent time related to whether are we becoming the victims of this identity theft or not? Yes, we are becoming. I have shown you one slide where a number of, uh, I mean, you know, uh, newspaper clips I have shown you where identity theft attacks have increased. Now, credit debit card data on sale on dark web. Now, see here the numbers. This is really alarming. We need to look at uh, very seriously on these matters. 10 crore Indians card data selling on dark web. This is the researcher, the organization is there, who is reporting this. The 10 crore is not a small number. So my card data is being sold on the dark web without my information. Data of 70 lakh Indian debit card, credit card holders uh, leaked on dark web. This is another news, December 8, 2020. Okay, and then another information on 19th April 2021, Domino's India data breach, 18 crore users and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is to be done is immediately as soon as you come to know about this, 
Mm. You have to change the passwords on these apps. That is very important. At the earliest, you have to do it. Okay. Yeah. So let us go back to this. So similarly, the identity theft related information is breached and then they sell it on dark web. Once they get your data, they sell it on dark web. ATM related frauds, this is quite old, but still relevant. One important thing you need to note is this is a skimming device. This is called a skimming device, which looks exactly like the original card reader having the same shape, same color, and same size. And it is a detachable device. It requires the criminal just two or three seconds to attach it to the ATM and then go out. When you swipe or insert the card into this particular card reader and swipe it out, what will happen is this particular device will copy your entire card data. Later on, this device will be connected to a laptop or any other device by the criminal and the criminal can create a duplicate of your card. Okay, this is this particular process is called as skimming. Now you might be thinking that, okay, my card data is copied, but what about my PIN? So for PIN, they may have these type of devices which are called as key loggers. So it logs whatever keys you are typing or entering on the ATM machines. And this is very common or some hidden cameras would be there, which you will not be able to realize. Okay. So you need to be very careful when you go to the ATM machines, just try to plug it out or pull it out. This particular, these type of devices don't apply force. Otherwise this entire ATM could come out. So, uh, so simply gently try to just check, shake it. If it, uh, if it, if it is really a detachable device, if it is a skimming device, then it would really come out. Okay, there are incidents happen. I don't have time. Otherwise, I would have shown you the videos where in Delhi and other places, in ICICI Bank, in SBI, and other bank ATMs, these type of uh, devices were found. Okay, so this is the chip that will be there. Okay, now thing is, you please remember that since December 2018, based on the RBI guideline, the government of India has instructed all the banks that they have to issue the chip cards to the users. And we have been using chip cards, right, presently. All our ATM cards, debit cards, or credit cards are chip cards. Those are no longer magnetic cards. So magnetic cards were vulnerable to skimming device, skimming, skimming kind of an attack. But please remember that from 2018, we have taken this step and those chip cards will not, uh, I mean, these particular devices, skimming devices are not capable of copying the chip card information. But wait, there is a twist here. There are devices that are called as shimmers also, shimmers. What is shimmer? Shimmer is another a magnetic kind of a device a cheap kind of a device, which when it is installed and configured or customized in this form, and when the chip card is inserted, it will copy the chip card based information also. And this is available on dark web for sale since 2015 itself. So, I mean, this kind of attack you cannot rule out now as well. That is what I want to highlight. Okay. Second thing is POS devices. Rogue POS devices means malicious POS devices. POS devices means point of sale terminals where you swipe the card and make the payment. Okay. These kind of devices on the right hand side, which you are seeing. Okay. So these devices can also have the skimmers or shimmers installed onto these devices. The criminals, what they're doing is these days using the 3D printers, they are printing this type of outer structures. Okay. And then they will, I mean, apply this particular power on the original device. So that is why one of the manufacturers of this uh, device, POS device, has issued an advisory saying that how to differentiate between a suspicious device and an original device. So the original device, the percentage of card which will be outside, okay, will be more than the, the card which is inside here. If, if the card is inserted and it goes, it, it is getting inserted too much into deep, then this is suspicious device because if this kind of external cover is put up, so obviously the card will go much deeper inside because of the outer cover. Whereas in the original device, the card will not go this much deep. 
So this is one indication, one way of identifying the suspicious and the safe device. Similarly, that company itself has released photos with their company's POS device saying that in order to identify suspicious, you just check the width. The width will be more because the width will obviously has to be more because this is the outer cover, so the width should be more when you are applying on. So here, the width will be less. The width will be more here, the width will be less here. Apart from that, here, the, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the keys are dark in nature and they are, they are there and here it's light and finally, you can see the green light here where you are not able to see. So these are a few of the indications to know that which is the original uh, device and which is the rogue device. Or now coming to uh, Aadhaar, many of the people I was just, uh, just before the presentation, I was just discussing with uh, another group about the security of Aadhaar. I want uh, you to interact with me in this particular uh, particular part of my session. Now, please tell me the answer to this question which I have written here. How much secure are Aadhaar servers? Can anyone tell me? Okay, first of all, I'll, 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 I'll reframe the question or rephrase the question. I'll ask you, are you confident about your Aadhaar servers? No, sir. Sorry? No, sir. Hello. No. Okay. You have to give me the reason also. Why no? Please tell me. Anyone else? You are not confident about other servers, right? Sir, probably because all the data is stored in a public server. What do you mean by public server? Sir, uh, all the data is like accessed through all the government operations. Yes, madam, exactly. Public servers, you have to keep the data in the public server only. You cannot keep it in private servers. Okay, if you want to, if you want to allow other based authentication, it is to be accessed. It should be accessible. Okay, is there any other concern? Okay, one concern is you are saying that it is in public servers, so we don't know whether the, what is the security of those servers, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, any other any other person wants to, or participant wants to, uh, I mean, put a point on, on this question? Please interact. We can move a little bit faster. No. Okay. Maybe data is not robust, is it? Data is not robust. Okay. Is this what you are saying? Okay. I'll do one thing. I'll just explain you the about the how Aadhaar works. Okay. Then hopefully you will be able to understand how Aadhaar works. Okay. Let us try to understand the Aadhaar authentication ecosystem. At least the uh, the, the degree holders and the engineering students, PCA students, I mean, we, the educated lot, should be able to understand the architecture and how Aadhaar works, okay, so that we can create this awareness. Now, uh, I'll just give you an example of ration shop. I hope that you all are aware of the uh, public distribution set, uh, system, PDS. So ration shop is the best example. If I go to collect my monthly ration, so what I have to do, I have to give my Aadhaar number and then he will authenticate me by way of OTP or biometric. Okay, so I am just need to follow my cursor. I am the Aadhaar holder, so I have got to I have went, I have gone to a uh, ration shop which is called a Sub AUA because they are running a software provided by AUA. So there is a Sub AUA. AUA means Authentication User Agency. So what happens is when I give my Aadhaar card. So the operator there or the person who is the in charge of that ration shop, he has entered my Aadhaar number and an OTP came to me. I gave him the OTP, he entered the OTP. So he's interacting with this particular application which he's seeing there, which is called a sub -AUA. Now this sub -AUA, what it does is it creates a packet format for my entire data. Okay, it is called a speed block, personal identity information block. Okay, so personal identity information block is created by sub AUA and forwarded to AUA, authentication user agency. 
Now, what is authentication user agency? This is the agency which actually, first of all, validates whether this guy who is sending me the data is valid person or not. And second thing, whether the data that is being sent by this guy, this ration shop guy, is in the standard format which is accepted by UIDI or not. So based on that, this AUA will format, will validate, and all those checks will be correct, will be validated, will be done by AUA itself, authentication user agency. Anyone can become authentication user agency. Please remember, you can also become AUA if you want to run the business of AUA. Now then from there, AUA forwards that data to ASA. ASA is authentication service agency. So what is authentication service agency? Authentication, unlike, unlike AUA, where anyone can become AUA, anyone cannot become ASA. Please remember, ASA are those agencies which are identified by UITI to be a official ASA, authentication service agency. So this particular data comes to ASA and ASA formats it, validates it, checks it, whether it is coming from a valid AUA or not, all those checks are done. And finally, it forwards the data to uh, UIDI server, which is called a CIDR, Central Identities Repository. Okay, this is what is done. Now, Aadhaar provides two types of services. One service is called as authentication service. When I'm saying authentication service, that means this ration shop guy has taken my Aadhaar plus OTP or Aadhaar plus biometric and passes it through sub AUA, AUA to ASA to UIDI server called CIDR. Now, if it is authentication service, then this CIDR will reply back to me only a yes or no response. Yes or no response means whether it is valid or not, whether this person exists or not, whether this Aadhaar number exists or not. So just a Y or N will be replied back. And this Y or N goes back to ASA from ASA to AUA, AUA to sub AUA. So your authentication is success or failed failure that will be indicated here. There is another service that Aadhaar offers. That particular service is called as EKYC service. EKYC service means uh, know your customer, electronic based know your customer service. So in electronic based know your customer service, what happens is when you give this information here, it goes. So now it will not be called as AUA, it will be called as KUA because you are running KYC service. So KUA, KUA, this will be called as KSA. So your request goes from here and all that goes to CIDR. Now CIDR will now take your demographic data. What do you mean by demographic data? Demographic data means your name, your email ID, your age, your house address and your photograph. Not your biometrics. Never ever your biometrics will be sent. Only the demographic data which I mentioned will go from here to ASA and from ASA to AUA and it lands to that particular agency. This is called as EKYC service. Okay, so now the most important point which I wanted to highlight here is the communication channel between AUA and ASA, between AUA and sub AUA is internet channel. It is from ASA to CIDR, it is a lease line connectivity. What do you mean by lease line connectivity? Suppose in Bangalore, if you have an agency which becomes ASA, this particular agency, ASA, has to extend the lease line connectivity from Bangalore to Delhi, Gurugram basically, Gurugram, because Aadhaar's primary server is in Gurugram. And one more server is there in Bangalore, I think near Manyata Tech Park or somewhere. Okay, so ASA. So this is where your lease line connectivity is to be extended. It is point to point, one to one connectivity by cable. So the criminals attacking and intercepting the data from this particular channel is quite uh, difficult, I can say almost kind of impossible. Okay, so that is how the Aadhaar authentication system works, Aadhaar authentication ecosystem works. So that is where we have the security. On top of that, here firewalls and I mean seven layer security which is mentioned in cyber security with various international standards is being followed here. 
So you'll have you'll have the physical security, you will have the personal security, you have the password security. Seven layers of security will be there before anyone goes to this particular server. So it is not quite easy to get your data. And another thing is your data, your parametric data or your sensitive data, which you are very much concerned about is quite safe in, in those servers. Okay, now to improve your confidence, Aadhaar has come up with the virtual ID as well. Is there anyone in this session who has already created a virtual ID? Can you please let me know? Is there anyone who has created a virtual ID? Yes or no? No. Anyone wants to create a virtual ID? Then go to UIDI. Okay. And then once the UIDI website opens, you go to Aadhaar services. Like here directly, you can go to Aadhaar services as well. I think the net is making, not net, basically this service is a little bit slow today. So Aadhaar services. And here you go and enter the Aadhaar number. There, there, will be one, there will be one link that is called as, that is called as virtual ID generator. So you, if you want to create a virtual ID, so you enter your original Aadhaar number and then that Aadhaar number, you have to enter OTP and CAPTCHA and all that, so not that information. Okay. So once you do that, so what will happen is you will be able to, you will be able to generate the virtual ID. See here, under my Aadhaar, you come here, Aadhaar services, uh, there is a virtual ID generator. I click on this and then here, virtual ID generator will come to Aadhaar. So they have recently modified this particular VID generator, virtual ID. So if you want to generate, you enter your Aadhaar number, enter the CAPTCHA, then you click on send OTP. Once you click on send OTP, an OTP will come to you and then there will be one more uh, text field comes here. You have to enter the OTP and click submit. Then you will receive a 16 digit number through SMS, which is called as virtual ID. What is virtual ID? It is a temporary ID. Aadhaar is a permanent ID. And this temporary ID is created using your original Aadhaar number only. Okay. Many a places, you don't need to give your Aadhaar number also. You just need to give the virtual ID only. And what is the validity of this virtual ID? Minimum is 24 hours validity. Okay, before 24 hours, you cannot create another virtual ID. Okay, after 24 hours, you have to create other virtual IDs also. Suppose if you are interested, if you are interested. Okay, let us say today I'm buying a SIM card. Okay, I will, I will submit virtual ID to the telecom operator. Even though telecom, for the telecom operator, it is not mandatory as per the Supreme Court order. But if you wish to give the Aadhaar number, I suggest that don't give the Aadhaar number. Instead, you give them the virtual ID. So tomorrow, again, after 24 hours, you can create another virtual ID. So minimum duration that you need to keep a virtual ID is 16 digit, uh, sorry, 24 hours. And it is a 16 digit number. And after 24 hours, you can create multiple virtual IDs. So that is how you can mask or you can protect your other number from revelation. Second thing is, if you are so much concerned about your biometrics, you can lock or unlock biometrics also. I have shown you here. Okay, if you see here, lock, unlock, Aadhaar number is also there. Oh, this is the new feature that we have added. Okay, lock, unlock, uh, Aadhaar. And then they have another, uh, uh, what is that? Option, lock, unlock, lock and unlock the biometric as well. Lock and lock biometrics. What do you mean by this? It is something like bank locker. In bank locker, you will have the key, but still manager also will have the key. But without you, manager cannot open. Without manager, you cannot open. So similarly, what you have to do is enter the Aadhaar number or virtual ID here, capture verification and all. And once you get the OTP and do this particular process, it asks you whether you want to lock the biometric. So if you lock the biometric, so no one can use your biometric also unauthorizedly, illegally. Even you also cannot use because you have logged it. So whenever you want to use, you can unlock it. Okay. So all these options which you are seeing here on the website, you can always like all these options under my Aadhaar. 
put on features are there. All these features they have already put up on Aadhaar mobile app. M is called as M Aadhaar. So better download this M Aadhaar application. So you'll be able to get so many uh, features on that. You can download your Aadhaar, Aadhaar reprint, virtual ID generator, EKYC. Okay, verify Aadhaar, verify mobile number, lock unlock bracket, set Aadhaar lock, generate TOTP, all that. What is TOTP? Basically, the OTP that you receive from SMS, you don't want that OTP. Better you want to go for time-based OTP, which is generated on the mobile that you can. Okay, so these are the few of the features uh, that are there on Aadhaar. Okay, or identity theft, as I told you, fraudulently or dishonestly using some else's electronic signature. So right now my time is up. Uh, I think that I'll start my session here sometime later whenever another opportunity comes. At that time, I would like to uh, I mean, talk on other topics as well. I'll take, uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm ready to take any sort of questions related to this one. Sir, masking your uh, identity, that is uh, the original Ada number, so will it not uh, conflict the concept of primary key because each one will have the different mirror images of so many uh, virtual IDs and uh, will it not provoke the fraud also because you, you can create any number of sims using a different uh, you know other uh, virtual IDs will it not again be a theft? See virtual IDs virtual IDs are derived from your unique ID identity only, Aadhaar only. So all these virtual IDs are unique in nature. Okay. So if he's getting the SIM card by submitting the virtual ID, obviously his virtual ID will be validated. Okay. SIM cards you can always buy. N number of SIM cards you can buy. No one will stop. Okay. Illegally also people can give different people's Aadhaar number and can buy. Okay, so what I'm saying is, if you mask the Aadhaar number, my Aadhaar number, if I'm masking it, I'm locking it basically. So the benefit that I'm getting is, other person will not be able to illegally use or without my information, unauthorizedly use my Aadhaar number, right? Okay, now in, in recently, there have been so many cases that have come up wherein people have complained that they have gone for a vaccination, but there, the authority, they have said that you are already vaccinated. They were truly, fully surprised. How come? Because their Aadhaar number is showing that for this particular Aadhaar number, the vaccination is already done. So they have fought and then they have argued. Finally, they said, that, okay, sir, the certificate that you will get will be of that old uh, date only. You can get the vaccination now. Okay, that is how it is. So people have used, misuse I can say, or unauthorizedly used without my permission, they have used the Aadhaar number. Okay, and uh, there are a couple of cases where, uh, I mean, a Karnataka person got the vaccination certificate from Jaipur because of the Aadhaar number. So if you mask it, you are going to you are going to protect your Aadhaar number from misuse of it. Okay. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. There is any other any question? Any other questions? Can? I'll show you one website which uh, our CDAC has created. Better to go to this website for more information. See on the screen, infosecavernance.in. You go to this website, very good website, having very good amount of information on this. Children, student, woman, family. So tips, for information security tips for all different types of people and then there is one more thing here if you go downloads you click on downloads you have alerts annual magazines brochures minimals handbooks cartoon series cartoon series for kids very good okay very good email account hacking cyber crime what is cyber bullying and all that so cartoon stories they have created and then they have published these handbooks so for handbooks you can see awareness for women handbook Okay, and then they have uh, recently they have come up with a very good uh, book that is called a Cyber Girl, Cyber Safe Girl. 
okay, 3.0 is the latest version, I think. So keep uh, visiting this website. Uh, you, you have uh, very good resources on this and the presentation that we use, uh, these presentations are from this only. These presentations are related to this only. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, if you have uh, information security YouTube channel also is there. Information security YouTube channel, ISCA, search. Okay, okay and by better I will directly go to youtube.com only. Information security. See this one. This is the logo. Okay, around 1202 videos are there. Okay. This will be very good for all of you. They have, they have started creating the movies also now. Okay, five minute, four and a half minute movie. Okay, and then it's very good for, and then recently whatever uh, whatever trainings we have given and whatever trainings experts have given, all those videos are there. And for kids also, there are um, videos available on this website. Okay. So that entire information on, is there on this particular website. Even for computer networks, network security, information security, ethical hacking, okay, security operations center, so many topics you will see the videos. 1200 videos is not a small number, right? Over the time, for the last 10, 12 years, they have come up with very good uh, information. And for kids also, cartoon type of stories kind of videos are also there. So better make use of this and get benefited. Okay. Dr. Mesma, sorry to interrupt. Can you also show the PK India YouTube videos? Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll share it again now. One more very good, like Dr. Balaji has just now given the, uh, what is that? Talk on digital signature. So we have one website called PKI India. It's a single word, dot in. So if you go to this website, I think recently Dr. Balaji has changed his certificate. Okay. So very recently we had conducted one international conference. That is what is the website. Uh, so this website provides you a lot of digital signature related resources. Okay. I think the high definition photos he, he has directly used without uh, uh, making it lightweight. So the programs that we have conducted given here, the resources, if you see, if whatever he has taught you just now in his session, if you want to learn by yourself, then uh, you can see this, you can even self-learn. And the related videos are already there on the YouTube. Okay, quiz is also provided. Okay, unscramble, like uh, here you need to, the digital signature, whatever he has explained to you. So that step-by-step uh, -step process, if you want to learn and understand, if you have understood, then test yourself, your knowledge, and then simply uh, in uh, pick up and drop AI stands across the globe. Okay. So from the technology perspective, what are the advancements from the protocol and standards perspective, what are the advancements, applications, as well as policy and law. Okay. For the detailed report, you can click here. So this is a very uh, important uh, website related to the PKI. Okay. So always visit this particular website. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, gain more and more information uh, on this topic as well. Okay, the same with the name uh, with the same name PKI India. The YouTube channel is also there. Show slash PKI India. YouTube.com slash PKI India. So if you go to this particular channel, you will see uh, many, many videos, whatever uh, conference we have recently conducted, all those talks, how to digitally sign MS Word document. Okay, so all those videos are there. We conducted the uh, residential programs here. Those videos are also there. And then animation wise, we have created uh, uh, many of the videos uh, with the animation, like here blockchain uh, tutorial, and then they have created digital uh, time stamping and all that. Okay. So make use of this particular resource. Hopefully, uh, you will get uh, benefited as well. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll Definitely. Sir, that's, 
That's that's a really a great resource that what you are showing to us. So just one one question is coming in my mind, um, sir. Is there is any um, an provision or an opportunity for the the students of uh, BCA to have something related to the boot camps on uh, on the securities uh, training programs from CIDA? Is there any uh, services or an extension from your end? Madam, actually, have... we conduct uh, we conduct diploma courses. Those are postgraduate diploma courses. Once they complete the uh, I mean, engineering or MCA or MSc, uh, mm. they have to write a national level entrance called as CCAT, CDAC uh, Competency and Aptitude Test. Just recently, last uh, Saturday itself, we uh, conducted that around 13,000 students appeared across India. So we have 4,000 seats across India. Bangalore has around 500 seats, okay, in various mm. diploma courses, diploma in advanced computing and all. So diploma in advanced computing, diploma in information security, then we have diploma in big data analytics, diploma in embedded system design, diploma in IoT. So these are the five courses we are running here. When we go uh, I mean, full strength, we get uh, the admissions. And the good thing about this diploma is we provide placement assistance because we have, I mean, it's kind of, uh, we are providing the training to the students on the life projects. So companies also likes that and they get the, uh, what is it, trained manpower directly as a freshman, right? So, and, and we try to bridge the gap between the industry and the academia. So those type of courses really help the students and uh, uh, placement, the placement uh, percentage that we, we have here in Bangalore varies between 90 to 95 percent, okay? So uh, some sort of, I mean, some uh, very good uh, talented students, they have got uh, 20 lakh package also very recently in, in the last, last batch. Just after completing of six months diploma, it's quite a uh, good thing, right? But, so on, on the six months diploma, if you are getting 20 lakh, uh, so because a rigorous uh, training is uh, given to them, half a day theory and half a day uh, was it, uh, lab exercises will be given. And those students who are staying in electronic city, uh, suppose if they have taken admission and then if they get placed in electronic city, then we have the hostel as well. And due to hostel, we give them lab access 24 by 7 so that they can practice. So every subject will have a project. They have to do the project. Suppose if it is a 15 day or 20 day uh, subject also, module also, they have to do the project. So that kind of rigorous diploma is there. Apart from that, internships we do provide, but those for those internships, uh, we look at the, as per the corporate uh, order that we have uh, received from our head office pony, that uh, NIRF uh, ranking, suppose it is less than 200, they have within 200, then those type of uh, universities or colleges will be provided. Suppose if they are approaching, then we provide the student the internship. So this is after the completion of their undergraduate program. Not no, internship, project their... internships. Project internships will be given for the BTEC final year students and MTEC final year students. So that is only for the engineering degrees. Yeah, and engineering as well as MCA. MCA. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the information. Thank you, sir. Your insights on cybersecurity, types of web and recent statistics on identity and data theft did install the importance of awareness on cybersecurity. We all know privacy is dead and social media holds the smoking gun. So today on occasion of Data Protection Day, let's all pledge to educate ourselves and others to be aware of all the threats on digital platform. As we have neared the end of the session, I would request Professor Ashwin Kumar Koti, IQAC coordinator to do the word of thanks. How it was for girls, how difficult it was for girls, you would express that wish, you would express that desire, and follow that desire. Uh, am I audible? How does you get? She said she's yeah. her best man, Morna, who she's having with her. Ashwin, sir, I think you need to switch off.
institutional social responsibility project and the cyber awareness program was was designed and this program was created to educate the students on cyber attacks and how to protect themselves and their community from potential attacks wonderful program indeed and my sincerest gratitude goes to mr kirtan kumar ceo act uh, mr k matai director act dr suresh hegadi sir principal sims Uh, Professor Shiv Kumar Ganacharya, sir, Vice Principal. All these people have been always a great source of inspiration and for the conduct of uh, such events. Uh, thank you all, and my special thanks, my special heartfelt gratitude to the guest of honor and Cyber Vidya Pit Chairman, Mr. Shashank Guru Yar, sir. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful information, sir, from your end. Especially, I was thrilled by the. Uh, numbers that you stated like 30000 experts being there and around 10 lakh opportunity still awaiting and uh, it's very inspiring that the world is looking on to india for experts and engineers okay that's uh, wonderful and my thanks goes to mr balaji venkateshwar sir the chief mentor cyber vidyapeet mm, the digital uh, i was very moved by the digital signature knowledge to you know how that you provided us likewise the fishing wishing smishing the differences between these things and um, the threats involved in uh, pace maker the threats to pace makers and gas pipelines that was so um, that was that that's really so dangerous and you guided us on those things like how fishing can affect these things crappling os java.net and there was a subtle message that our students should really follow Uh, why always we keep following something that is done? India has a great potential to develop operating systems, front ends, and uh, social uh, media's and all. So that was a great information from your end. And India producing seven million IT professionals is a is a great thing. And certainly we should uh, stop policing and we should start engineering. Uh, that was great message from you. And further, my thanks goes to Mr. Balaji Rajendra sir. the associate director cdc integrity attack element of trust especially the pki ecosystem that was wonderful information from your answer we had real lot of learning from there and 